So long as these problems are not solved, so long as ignorance and poverty remain on earth, these words cannot be useless. These words set forth the soul and spirit of one of the world's great literary masterpieces, Les Miserables. Out of the depths of his pity for suffering mankind, Victor Hugo drew a compelling story, one that will live so long as bewildered humanity shall continue to grope toward the light. Tonight, WOR and the Mutual Network bring you the first of seven broadcasts based on this great novel. Each episode will depict some vital development in the epic of Jean Valjean. Orson Welles, author, director, and actor, has assembled a notable cast and offers an interpretation created specifically for radio presentation. Mr. Wells will play the role of Jean Valjean. And those sections of the book itself, which in running narrative bind together the dramatic episodes, will also be read by him. Les Miserables begins. Part one. The episode which is called The Bishop. <laughs> An hour before sundown, on the evening of a day in the beginning of October, 1815, a man traveling on foot was seen entering the little town of D. Nobody knew him. He looked ragged and mean. He must have come far that day, for he looked weary. The traveler went first to the mayor's office with his passport and then turned his steps toward the inn. A man who wants food and a bed. One moment, monsieur. Good evening. Is dinner ready? Monsieur, I'm sorry. I cannot receive you. Are you afraid I won't pay you? I have money. I'll pay in advance. I have no room. Well, then, put me in the stable. I'll pay you. I'm sorry. Well, the attic or a corner of the kitchen. I must have lodging. We'll see after dinner. I can't give you dinner. But I'm hungry. I've been walking since sunrise. Twelve leagues. I'm hungry. Get out. What do you mean? You heard me. Get out. But I... I don't understand. Monsieur... I suspected something when I saw you go into the mayor's office. So I sent my boy across to find out. Monsieur, shall I tell you your name? Oh. So you know. The traveler looked at the innkeeper, bowed his head, picked up his knapsack and went off down the street. If he had turned, he would have seen the innkeeper in his doorway, pointing him out as he went, to the guests of the inn and to the passers-by. Night came on. It had begun to rain. He passed the prison. Mr. Turnkey! Mr. Turnkey! Well, what is it? Mr. Turnkey, your pardon. Will you let me stay here tonight? This is a jail, not a tavern. Get yourself arrested. The traveler did not know the streets. He walked at random. He came to the prefecture and then to the seminary. As he passed the cathedral square, he shook his fist at the church. Then he stopped at a stone bench in the bishop's street and lay down there, hoping for sleep. Who was this man? He was a criminal, and he had paid for his crime. He was an ex-convict. He was tried 19 years before, in 1796. My name is Jean Valjean. Prisoner... You are accused of burglary. Have you nothing to say? Yes, Excellency. 
I was hungry. It was not our concern, prisoner. Proven fact of your guilt is not altered by the circumstance of your stomach. <laughs> Excellency, I was very hungry. My name is Jean Valjean, Excellency. I come from Brie. My father and mother are both dead, and my sister's husband is dead too, so she lives with me at Favarol. She and her little ones. They are hungry too. Excellency, I'm a pruner at Favarol, and in the pruning season I earn 18 sous a day. And that's all. It's very hard, Excellency. It's a very hard winter. There's no work, and there's no bread. No bread at all. Just no bread, Excellency. None. And I can't find any work. And they're all hungry, Excellency. More hungry than me, much. The seven little ones. And no bread in the house. Mm. <clears throat> Prisoner, you were apprehended by police officers in the possession of stolen property. This court has reviewed the charge... And here finds proven finally against the prisoner the crime for which he's on trial. Namely, the burglary of one loaf of bread. Excellency, what does that mean? It means, prisoner, you're a thief. The court finds you guilty. I didn't know I was a thief. Jean Valjean, you are sentenced to five years in the galleys. The galleys. Five years at the oar of a prison ship. The terms of the code were explicit. Five years in torment. On the 22nd of April, 1797, a great chain was riveted. And Jean Valjean was a part of this chain. He was no longer Jean Valjean. He was 24,601. What had become of the sister? What became of the seven children? Who cared about that? What becomes of the leaves of the young tree when it sawed at the trunk? And all this time, Jean Valjean talked little, and he never laughed. When he left the galleys, he had not shed a tear for 19 years. 19 long years. For near the end of his fourth year in the prison ship, Jean Valjean escaped. On the evening of the second day, he was retaken. Number 24601, for attempted escape, the prisoner's sentence extended three years. Three years, which made eight. The sixth year... 24,599. Here. 24,600. Here. 24,601. 24,601. 24,601. 24,601 is not present. The prisoner has escaped. Fire the alarm, cannon. That night they found him. He resisted the galley guard. Escape and resistance. Under provisions in the special code, the prisoner's sentence extended... Five years. Two with a double chain. Five years, which made 13. The tenth year. Attempted escape. The prisoner's sentence extended. Three years. Three years, which made 16. The thirteenth year. Attempted escape. Beat taken after an absence of four hours. The prisoner's sentence extended. Three years. Three years for four hours, which made 19. In October 1815, Jean Valjean was set free. He had entered in 1796 for having taken a loaf of bread. The rain fell heavily, and Jean Valjean was cold on the stone bench. Just then, a woman came out of the church and saw him lying there in the dark. My friend, what are you doing? You see what I'm doing. I'm going to sleep. Why don't you go to the inn? I have no money. You can't pass the night in the rain. Have you knocked at every door? Yes. Have you knocked at that one there? No. Knock there. And she
She pointed to a little low house on the other side of the square. It was the palace of the bishop. This first part of our story is concerned with two people. One of them is Jean Valjean, and the other is Charles Francois Bienvenu Muriel, called Monsignor Bienvenu, who was the Bishop of D. We must pause to examine this Bishop of D in order to understand what is to follow. One day, he preached this sermon in the cathedral. My very dear brethren, there are in France 346,000 cottages with only one opening, the door. This is because of the tax upon windows. God gives men light, and the law sells it. In the upper and lower out, they make bread once in six months. In the winter, it is so hard, they must cut it with an axe. My brethren, behold how much suffering is around you. The Bishop of D lived very humbly. He had no retinue, and there was with him in his house only two old ladies his housekeeper, and his sister, Mademoiselle Battistine. Here is a letter written by his sister to some girlhood companion. December 16th, 1814. My dear madame, not a day passes that we do not speak of you. I am happy, but the weather is severe, and one must do something for those who lack. My brother is so good. He gives all he has to the poor and sick. He exposes himself to every danger. He goes out in the rain, travels in winter. He has no fear of darkness or of dangerous roads or of those he may meet. Last year, he went up all alone into a district infested with robbers. And when he came back, nothing had happened to him. He said, see how they have robbed me. And he opened a trunk in which he had the jewels of the Ambra Cathedral, which the robbers had given him. Upon that occasion, I could not help but scold him, taking care only to speak when the carriage had made a noise so that no one could hear us. The housekeeper has had difficulty accustoming herself to what she calls his imprudence. But now that the thing is settled, we pray together. We are afraid together. And we go to sleep. Should Satan come to this house, no one would interfere. But after all, what is there to fear in this house? Farewell. With a thousand good wishes, that is team. It will be seen that the bishop was a good man. He had no systems, but many deeds. When he had money... He visited the poor. When he had none, he visited the rich. So Jean Valjean knocked at his door. The events of that evening, early in October 1815, have often been related by Mademoiselle Battistine. The bishop had been waiting for his supper. He was standing in the dining room by the fire. In the dining room, there was a door opening on the street. His housekeeper, who was setting the table, was just telling his sister about Jean Valjean. He has a club to beat you with, a rope to hang you with, and a sack to put you in when you're dead. God save us. Did you see this man? I did not see him at all, thank heaven, Mademoiselle Baptistine. Then, madame, how do you know how he looked? Your greatness, he was described to me in the market. Well, madame... Do you think we're in very grave danger? Oh, awful, your greatness, with no locks on the doors. And I say, Monseigneur, and Mademoiselle Baptistine here says also Me, madame, that... I say nothing. 
What my brother does is well done. We say this house isn't safe. We say that a door which opens by a latch on the outside to the first comer, nothing in the world could be more horrible. And your greatness does have the habit, if I do say so, of always saying, come in. Goodness, come in, even at midnight. The Lord knows there's no need to ask leave to come in at this house when even the beggars... Come in. It is he. Come in, monsieur. Listen to me. Listen to me before you say anything. Listen. I'm a convict. You hear that? I've been 19 years in the galleys. Four days ago, they let me out. And I've walked all this way from Toulon. And I went to the inn, but they sent me away. The jailer wouldn't let me into the prison. No one will have me. I'm a convict. I tried to sleep out under the stars. But there were no stars. It rained. And there was no good God to stop the drops. A woman showed me your house and said to me, Not there. So I'm not. Look, I have money, 109 francs and 15 sous, which I earned in the galleys. I'll pay you. I'll pay you anything. I walked 12 leagues today and I'm so hungry. Please, have your stable. Come in, monsieur, and shut the door. Wait. Did you hear what I said? I said I was a convict. Brother, this is the man. You want to see my passport? Here it is. My yellow passport. Read it. Very well, monsieur. The bear is a liberated convict, having been 19 years in the galleys. Original sentence, five years. Additional servitude, 14 years. The holder of this passport is a very dangerous man. Oh, your greatness, what shall we do? Set another place at the table. But your greatness... Madame, I... do as my brother says. Put on another plate. Yes, mademoiselle. Do you, you mean I can stay? Me? A convict? I thought you'd send me away. So I told you right off who I am. Uh, Pedestine, uh, put some sheets on the bed in the alcove. Yes, brother. A bed? You mean... I'll have a bed like other people. With sheets and mattress. <laughs> it's 19 years since I've slept on a bed. Thank you, Monsieur Innkeeper. I'll pay you all you say. You're a good man. You you are an innkeeper, aren't you? No, Monsieur. I am a priest who lives here. Oh, of course, you cap. You're the cure. The cure of the big church. Then, then you don't want me to pay. No, Monsieur. Come near the fire. Oh, this lamp is poor. I light the candles. I don't understand. I don't understand. You let me, a galley slave, enter your house. You even light your silver candlesticks for me without so much as asking my name. Monsieur, my name is Jean Valjean. Well, this is not my house, Jean Valjean. Is the house of Christ. But besides, why should I ask your name? Before you told me, I knew it. You... you knew it? Monsieur, your name is my brother. Your greatness, the table is set. Ah, good. But Madame Magloire... Yes, your greatness? Uh, something is lacking. Is it not the custom to place all six of our silver plates on the table? Yes, your greatness, but... I, I count only three... I'll fetch them. Ah, that's better. Ah, Badestine, is that a bottle of wine I see there? Indeed, yes. The fine old mauve for the special occasions. Madame Magloire put it out. Here are the plates, Your Greatness. Oh, thank you, Madame Magloire. I have misjudged you. Come, then, to supper. Monsieur Valjean, you sit there by my sister. Oh, this is too good for me. Oh, monsieur, if you knew what this means... After 19 years in the chains. Jean, you have left all that suffering. Remember this. If you leave it with hate and anger, you are worthy of compassion. But if you leave it with goodwill and peace, you are better than any of us. Heavenly Father, 
We ask thy blessing on his food as we partake of it. May it strengthen us to everlasting life. Amen. Mademoiselle Battistine described the progress of this supper in a letter written to a friend. All I can say is that my brother took supper with this Jean Valjean with the same manner he would have used with the provost or the curé of this parish. After we had eaten, my brother turned to him and said, You must be very tired. I'll show you to your room. He then did so, lighting away with one of his candlesticks. Madame Magloire and I said our prayers in the parlor and retired to our chambers without saying a word. Jean Valjean lay in his bed that night and thought of the bishop's silver. Those six silver plates. He had seen the old housekeeper putting them away in the cupboard. He had marked that cupboard well. Solid silver. They would bring at least 200 francs, double his pay for 19 years' labor. What had been the life of this soul? Society should look into these things. They are its own works. In weariness, in agony, under the whip, under the chain, in the cell, on the convict's bed of plank, under the burning sun of the galleys, Jean Valjean turned to his conscience and reflected... To those who saw him, he seemed looking continually upon something terrible. For human society had done him nothing but injury. No man had ever touched him but to bruise him. Never since childhood had he been greeted with a friendly word. He had no weapon but his hate. He had resolved to sharpen it in the galleys, and he had taken it with him when he went out. So the passport was right. The yellow passport, which described Jean Valjean as a very dangerous man. The next morning at sunrise, the bishop was walking in his garden. Madame Magloire ran up to him quite beside herself. Monseigneur, your greatness, it's gone. Yes, madame. Monseigneur, it's all gone. And the man with the beard and the yellow passport. Madame... What is gone? Your greatness is silver. It's been stolen. The six lovely plates, your only treasure. Oh, Monseigneur, I was right. I should never have put them on the table. He has stolen them. Well, then, let us consider. Yes, Monseigneur. Firstly, did the silver belong to us? No. No, Monseigneur? No. It belonged to the poor. And now, secondly, who was that man? He was a poor man. I suppose so, Your Greatness, but he knew silver when he saw it, even if he didn't recognize a bishop from a curry. Oh, Monseigneur, it is not myself I'm thinking of, nor of your sister. I worry on your account. What are you going to eat from? Have we no tin plates? Tin smells. Well, then, iron. But iron has such a bad taste. There are always wooden plates. Oh, yes, Monseigneur, I wish it. But what an idea to take that man. Brother, brother, they've caught the man. Oh, thank God. Have they put him in jail? No, they've brought him here with the silver. They're outside the gate now. Brother, the police want you to identify him. Very well. Show them in. Come along now. Let's have none of your talk. Please. Simon! Prisoner, take your cap off in the presence of the bishop. Bishop. Good morning, Valjean. You recognize him, Monsignor. That's enough. Here is your silver. Yes. But where are my candlesticks? Here are the stolen plates, Monsignor. Were there candlesticks, too? Oh, yes. Yes, they are of silver, like the rest. Valjean, where are my candlesticks? I, I didn't take them. Madame Magloire, be kind enough to go in and get them. What, Monsignor? Go get the candlesticks. But I... Very well, Monsignor. Monsieur Valjean, I don't think you understood. I gave you the candlesticks as well. What? What do you mean? Monsignor, 
The prisoner was running off with your plates. And he told you they were given him by an old priest with whom he had lodged the night. And you brought him here. Yes, Monsignor. Then it's true what he told me? I have given him the silver. Then we can let him go? <laughs> but of course. Here are your candlesticks, but I must say... Madame Magloire, give them to Monsieur Valjean. Yes, Your Greatness. Here. But uh, I... Take them, you fool. But they aren't mine. Monsieur, the plates and the candlesticks are yours. Take them. But never forget that you have promised me to use this silver to become an honest man. I... I have promised you. Jean Valjean, I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity and give it to Almighty God. Jean ran out of the city as though he were escaping and made haste into the open country. A little gypsy boy passed by and dropped a penny. Jean Valjean put his foot on it and drove the boy away. Then he picked it up and ran after the boy. But he never found him. He found himself. He knew then that he must conquer or be conquered. He saw before him himself as he was, stick in hand, knapsack on his shoulders, the hideous galley slave, Jean Valjean. He beheld himself face to face and saw at the same time a light like a torch. And he knew that this torch was the bishop Jean Valjean shrank and vanished. The bishop remained. There came to him the bishop's own words. Jean Valjean, you have promised me to become an honest man. I have purchased your soul. Then his heart swelled up in him and he burst into tears. It was the first time he had wept in 19 years. How long did he weep thus? What did he do after weeping? Where did he go? No one ever knew. Only one thing is certain. On that very night, at three o'clock in the morning, a figure was seen in the attitude of prayer, kneeling upon the pavement, in the shadow, before the door of the Bishop of D. <laughs> W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have presented part one, The Bishop, of Victor Hugo's absorbing story, Les Miserables. Orson Welles has played the role of Jean Valjean and read the narrative passages of this presentation which he has prepared specifically for radio broadcasting. Next Friday evening at 10 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time, we shall present Les Miserables in its second episode, which introduces Javert. This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System. Les Miserables, Part Two, the episode which is called. Javert. 1817. Napoleon was at St. Helena. 
A thing which smoked and clacked on the Seine went and came beneath the windows of the Tuileries. It was a sort of toy called the steamboat. 1817. It was in this year that four young gentlemen of Paris played a joke on their sweethearts. One of these young gentlemen was Felix Ptolemy, and his sweetheart was Fontaine. Excuse me, please, ladies. Yes? What is it? It's something your gentleman left for you. Well, there's no address. See what's written on it, Fontaine. It says, this is the surprise. Oh, what's inside? Just a moment. Sweetheart, at the moment when you read this, four mettlesome horses will be bearing us back to our mamas and papas. We are returning to society to duty and to order on a full trot at the rate of three leagues an hour. Mourn for us rapidly and replace us speedily. Adieu. Signed, Blancheville, Fanny Listolet, and Felix Ptolemy. P.S. The dinner is paid for. It was a good joke. The girls laughed. Fontaine laughed like the rest. But later she wept bitterly. For Ptolemy was her first love. And the poor girl had a child. This, it will be remembered, was in 1817. At 22 years of age, on a fine spring morning, Fontaine left Paris a child in her arms. She went back to Montreux, where she was born. And she found the little city greatly changed. An unknown man, a stranger, had conceived the idea of substituting gum lac for resin in the manufacture of synthetic jet. This very slight change worked an industrial revolution. In less than three years, the inventor of this process had made a fortune for himself and for the whole region. He had built a great factory in which there were two workshops, one for men and the other for women. Yes, what is it? Are there jobs open in the workshop? There are always jobs here. Have you a husband? No, monsieur. Any dependents? No. Name? Uh, Mademoiselle Fantine. You will commence today. Monsieur Madeleine, the owner, requests only that you be willing and of good morals. Oh, yes, monsieur. I'll assign you to your place. Come with me. So Fontaine went to work in the jet factory and kept a secret. For as long as she stayed there, they must never find out about her child. She had left this child in the care of a couple she met on the road to Paris. They were innkeepers and they were called the Tenadiers. She paid them 57 francs, all that she had, and she trusted them. A letter for you, mademoiselle. Thank you. My dear madame, your little Cosette has outworn her wardrobe. It will be impossible for us to keep Cosette with us any longer for less than 12 francs per week, payable in advance. Sincerely, Thénardier. They had pawned the child's wardrobe. Who were these Thénardiers? The woman was a brute, and the man was a blackguard. But Fontaine knew nothing of this, and she sent them the money. The child's clothes being gone, they dressed her in rags. And they fed her on scraps, little better than the dog, and a little worse than the cat. They put her to work. She was made to run errands, to sweep the rooms, and the yard, and the street. In the village, they call this little child the lark. This tiny being no larger than a bird, trembling, frightened and shivering, awake each morning, first of all in the house and in the village, and always on the street or the fields before dawn. But the poor lark never sang. Fontaine took a small room 
and furnished it on the credit of a future labor. She worked hard, thought of nothing but Cosette, and was almost happy. Not being able to say she was married, she took care not to speak of her child. But the women began to whisper in the workshop, and Fontaine was watched. More than a few were jealous of her fine teeth and her golden hair. Mademoiselle! Oh, yes, monsieur. You have been with us in this establishment for over a year. Here are 50 francs. 50 francs? They are donated by your employer, Monsieur Madeleine. They will cover your expenses. I must ask you to seek employment elsewhere. Elsewhere? What do you mean? Mademoiselle, the existence of your child has been revealed to us. Good day, mademoiselle. Fontaine offered herself as a servant, but nobody wanted her. She began to make coarse shirts for the soldiers. For 12 sous, she sold 17 hours a day, but her creditors gave her no rest. How could she pay? She couldn't. How could she live? She learned. She learned from an old woman who sewed with her, named Marguerite. We who have grown old in privation can extract much from a sou. Fifteen francs, Marguerite. Think of it. The Thénardiers wrote me. They want three more francs a week, and, and you know what I earn. You'll learn. But you can't live on six sous a day. No, my girl. But you can starve on it. It's a science. Summer passed away, and winter returned. Short days and less work. In winter, there is no heat, no light, no moon. Evening touches morning. The whole day is a cave, and the sun is a pauper. Madame Fantine, Cosette is sick of an epidemic disease, a military fever. She must have medicine, and drugs are dear. Unless you send us 40 francs within a week, the little one will die. Sincerely, Thénardier. <laughs> The secrets of the Orient. Ladies and gentlemen, I offer during my brief stay in this beautiful city the seven wonders of the world. No wheel is so great, but I own its lemonade. Heartaches and toothaches. The elixir of life, the powder of love, the pill against pain. If your teeth hurt you, I will pull them out. Would you look beautiful? I will put them in. I have whole sets of teeth complete for your pleasure. Pearly teeth. Teeth for any mouth. Ah, you there. You girl who is laughing there. You have pretty teeth. Sell me your two incisors, and I'll give you a gold Napoleon for each of them. What's that? What are incisors? Incisors, young lady, are the front teeth in the head. The two pretty upper ones. Oh. Consider my beauty. Two gold Napoleons, 40 francs. How much good will they do you? If you've got the courage for it, come this evening to the inn and you will find me there. Oh, no. Hold on, don't run away. Hold on. Come back. What's happened? Oh, God help me. Well, where have you been? In the square. There was a traveling dentist. He, he wanted to pull out my two front teeth. I, I should be hideous. I'd rather throw myself from the fifth story head first to the pavement. He told me he'd wait for me at the inn. What was it he offered you? Two Napoleons. That's 40 francs. Yes. 40 francs. They shouldn't allow it. Marguerite, what does it mean? A uh, military fever, you know? Well, it's a disease. Does it need many drugs? Terrible drugs. How does it come on you? It comes in a moment. Does it attack children? Do they die of it? He told me to wait for him at the inn. The next morning, when the old woman went into Fontaine's chamber before daybreak, for they always worked together and so made one candle do for two, she found Fontaine sitting there on the couch. She had not been to bed. Her cap had fallen in her lap. 
The candle had been let to burn, and it was almost gone. The old woman looked at her. What's happened now? Cosette won't die of that sickness for lack of drugs. Look there on the table. Two gold Napoleons. A fortune. Where'd you get them? I got them. Then Fantine smiled. The dying candle lit up her face. The corners of her mouth were stained with blood. The two teeth were gone. Madame Fantine. Send us 100 francs, or we will put out your child on the highway. 100 francs! What can I sell for 100 francs? Come, I shall sell what is left. What is the history of France? It is society buying a slave. From whom? From misery. A soul for a bit of bread. Alas, what are these destinies? Why are they so? He knows that sees all the shadow. He is alone. His name is God. Monsieur Madeleine was well loved in the village. But sometimes, when he passed along the street, calm, affectionate, followed by the benedictions of all, it happened that a tall man, wearing a flat hat and an iron gray coat, and armed with a stout cane, would turn round abruptly and follow him with his eyes until he disappeared. This man was one of the police. His name was Javert. The peasants of Asturias believe that in every litter of wolves there is one dog which is killed by the mother, lest on growing it should devour the others. Give a human face to this dog son of a wolf and you will have Javert. This man laughed rarely and terribly. And around his nose there was a wrinkle as broad and wild as the muzzle of a fallow deer. Javert with an eye always fixed upon Madeleine. The Notebook of Inspector Javert January 9th, 1818 Who is Madeleine? No one knows Who are his family? What is his history? Where does he come from? No one knows he is popular for his deeds of charity, which are done secretly as though they were bad deeds. He's been offered the Legion of Honor. He's refused it. Who is that man? I cannot be sure of what I guessed. But I know well I have seen him before. April 10th, 1820. Madeleine is in mourning for a certain Bishop of D. I watch him carefully. His speech is more mannerly and his accent more refined than it was when I first came to the city. He walks strangely with one foot dragging. He knows I am watching him. August 17th, 1822. The king has appointed Monsieur Madeleine the mayor of this city. Consider, the man came here with only a few hundred francs. He is now a millionaire. This is a sudden rise. I have now learned the circumstances of his arrival into this place. He came here a common laborer, stick in hand and sack on his back one evening in the autumn of 1815. That night, October 23rd, there was a fire in the townhouse. And this man leapt into the flames and saved from burning two children of the captain of police. 
As far as can be ascertained in the excitement and gratitude of the occasion, no one thought to ask him for his passport. There is certainly no record. He announced himself Madeleine, and so he has remained. I have made inquiries in Paris, and there are interesting circumstances relative to October 1815. Madeleine is now my immediate superior. Police routine brings me into contact with this man. He's well loved, but I am not deluded. I am still vigilant. I know that face. That year, there occurred two events on the streets of Montreal, which, while insignificant in themselves, made a profound impression on the mind of Inspector Javert. The first was a common street accident. Help! Help! <laughs> The old man, the horse slipped, the car turned over on him. He's getting up there, under the wheel, it's crushing his ribs. Get a jack. Has anybody a jack? God help me. God help me. Get a jack. They're gone for one. That wagon is sinking lower every minute. It can't be helped, sir. The wheel is killing me. Citizens! Listen to me. There is one chance. There's just room enough for one man to crawl in under that wagon. In half a minute, it'll be too late. Citizens, there is no time to lose. What can you do? What can you do, Inspector? If a man can get under that wheel, there may be hope for you. If a man can get under that wheel and lift it with his back, we may save you. Is there a man who can do it? Who has strength and courage? Five Louis d'Or for the man who will try it. Ten Louis d'Or. Ten Louis d'Or. He must be a terrible man who can raise a wagon like that on his back. I'm dying. My ribs are breaking a jack. Anything. Oh. Let me by. Let me by. Let me by, citizens. Oh, don't do it. Come back. You'll be killed. Stop him, somebody. Stop him. Monsieur, it is too late. Let me by, Inspector. As you wish, monsieur. No, no, go away. Don't come under here. It's too late. You let him go. Get out while you can. It's sinking. Get out. It's sinking. He's not there himself. They'll both be killed. Push. Push. It's lifting. Push. 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 You are a brave man. Thank you, Inspector. In all my life, I have known only one man capable of doing what I have just seen you do. He was a convict in the galleys at Toulon. Good day, Inspector. Good day, Monsieur Madeleine. That was the first incident. The second to impress Inspector Javert of the police took place on an evening in January, five months later. It was snowing. A woman, a rueful, bedizened specter, her shoulders bare in a gaudy ballroom dress, stood waiting in the street before the door of the officer's cafe. A well-dressed idler was amusing himself, tormenting this woman. Well, aren't you the ugly one? Oh, smoking tonight. All right, your haughtiness, turn your back on me. You'll pay for it. A little snow will be good medicine. Down your shoulder blades like this. The girl, screaming with rage, turned on him and buried her nails in his face, using the most frightful words that ever fell from the off-scouring of a guardhouse. A large crowd formed about them. The man, hatless, defending himself. The woman, kicking and striking, shrieking, toothless, and without hair, livid with anger and hideous. Suddenly, a tall man advanced quickly from the crowd and seized her by her muddy satin waist. Their tormentor stole away. The woman turned pale with horror. She recognized Javert. Stop. Go home, all of you. It is not permitted that crowds form on the streets. Gentlemen, disperse. Young woman, I must take you to prison. Come with me. To prison? 
The bread. Oh, no, monsieur. What is your name? Fantine. I have a good memory. This time it's six months. Six months? Six months in prison? Oh, no. No, I must earn money. I, I still owe 100 francs to the Thénardiers. I must ask you not to cause a disturbance. Oh, Monsieur Javert, please. I swear to you, by the good God, I was not in the wrong. Have they the right to throw snow down our backs? He said you're ugly. You've no teeth. I know I've no teeth, but I didn't do anything. No? What of his hat in the snow? Well, I, I did wrong to spoil his hat, but you can't imprison me for that. I must pay 100 francs or they'll turn out my cosette. She's such a little one. They were put out in the highway in the very heart of winter. If she were older, she could earn a living, but she's not yet sick. Come along. I've heard your story. You have six months. Oh, mercy, no! Not you fool! No. Do I have to drag you? One I... moment, if you please. I... Let me help you. Citizen, I warn you, don't obstruct the course of justice. There, there, mademoiselle. You'll be all right. This is insolent. Who are you? My name is Madeleine. The mayor. Your pardon, monsieur. I didn't recognize you in the shadow. The mayor? Madeleine? Uh, is this the famous Madeleine? Take care, woman. Uh, Monsieur Javert. Think of it. He's the cause of it all. He turned me away from his factory on account of some stories they told about me in the workshop. Stories about me. Lies. You see how it happens? He did this to me. I'm sorry, monsieur. <laughs> this will add to her sentence. That's all right, Inspector. Set the woman at liberty. What did you say, monsieur? Set the woman at liberty. At liberty? What? You mean I can go? I'm free? I don't understand. Well, who said that? It wasn't the mayor. It couldn't be. Was it you, Monsieur Javert? You, you've forgiven me? I, I did stamp on the gentleman's hat, but he, he spoiled my whole dress in the snow. We women, we have only one dress for the evening. Mademoiselle, how much did you say that you owed? I said nothing to you. You came here to scare me. I'm not scared of you. I'm scared of Javert. Only tonight it hurt me. I'm not very well. I cough. There's something in my chest that burns. Here, stop, stop. Here, give me a hand. Now, don't be afraid to feel how hot it is. Let's go, woman. You're drunk. Uh, officer! The inspector said you must release me. I'm going. Sergeant, detain this woman. Who told you to let her go? I did, Inspector. Your Honor, that cannot be done. And why not? This woman has insulted the citizen. I have learned the circumstances. It was the citizen who did wrong. She has also insulted the mayor. I can do what I please about that. Your pardon, monsieur, but you cannot. The insult does not rest with you. It rests with justice. Inspector, the highest justice is conscience. I have heard this woman. Content yourself with obeying. I obey my duty, monsieur. I am sorry to resist the The matter you speak of belongs to the municipal police. But, monsieur... I refer you to Article 81 of the law of December 19th, 1799. On the subject of legal imprisonment. You're well acquainted with the criminal code, monsieur, but if you will permit... You may go, Inspector. However, monsieur... You may go, Inspector. Yes, monsieur. Sergeant. Come, mademoiselle. It is cold. I... I don't understand. Monsieur Javert has gone. Yes. Yes, he's gone. Don't be frightened. I'm sorry. I didn't know all your story. I never knew you'd left my workshop. I'll make it up to you now. Make it up to me? Yes, Fontaine. And don't cry. I'll take care of your debts. My daughter. My Cosette. You shall go to her. And she shall come to live with you. You mean that, Monsieur Madeleine? You swear it? On my word of honor. Oh, monsieur. I am not a bad woman. Listen to me, Fontaine. If all you say is true, and I do not doubt it, you have never ceased to be virtuous and holy before God. That same night, Javert wrote a letter to the prefet of police, Paris. Monsieur... I wish to report that a certain face has always been familiar to me. Tonight, I placed it. I have further conclusive evidence. Monsieur Madeleine, the mayor of Montreux, is wanted by the police for robbery. He is a second offender, being an ex-convict. He is the old galley slave. Jean Valjean. Signed by the inspector of police, Javert.
W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have presented part two of Victor Hugo's compelling novel, Les Miserables, the episode which introduced Javert. Orson Welles played the role of Jean Valjean and also read the narrative passages of the presentation which he has created especially for radio. Assisting Mr. Wells tonight were Martin Gable as Javert, Agnes Moorhead, Ray Collins, Betty Gard, Hiram Sherman, Alice Frost, and others. Next Friday evening at 10 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Saving Time, we shall present Les Miserables in its third phase, the episode which portrays the death of Fantine and the capture of Jean Valjean. This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System. Miserable, part three, the episode which is called The Trial. I gave you the candlesticks that you stole from me. I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity, and I give it to Almighty God. So spoke the Bishop of D to a thief and a galley slave named Jean Valjean. And from the moment he left him, Jean Valjean was another man. He was Monsieur Madeleine. In time, he was the mayor of Montreux. He had sold the bishop's silver, keeping only the candlesticks. And with this money, he made more. He was established in Montreux the owner of a great factory and a public official, a quiet, hopeful man having but two thoughts, to conceal his name and to sanctify his life, to escape from men and to return to God. But a shadow had fallen across the destiny of Jean Valjean, the shadow of a man in a flat hat and a long coat, a man carrying a stick, Javert. Monsieur Madeleine. Yes. Inspector Javert, the police. Let him come in. Yes, monsieur. This way, Inspector. Monsieur Madeleine. Good morning, Javert. Well, what's the matter? Your Honor, I wish to report a criminal act. Yes, Inspector. An inferior agent of the government has been lacking in respect to a magistrate. It's my duty to bring the fact to your knowledge. Who is this agent? I, monsieur... You, Inspector? I am. And who is the magistrate who has to complain of this agent? You, monsieur. I came to ask you to be so kind as to discharge me. Never, this is absurd. You will say that I might tender my resignation, but to resign is honorable. I must be discharged. Javert, what's all this nonsense? Your Honor, I have denounced you. You... You have denounced me? Yes, Your Honor, to the prefecture of police. <laughs> what for, Javert? As a mayor encroaching upon the constabulary? No, monsieur. As an ex-convict. Yes, Javert. For a long time I suspected you. The resemblance, your immense strength, your skill as a marksman. It's strange, monsieur, but everything points to one fact. That you are a man named Jean Valjean. What name did you say? Jean Valjean. An old convict I saw 20 years ago when I was a galley guard at Toulon. For eight years his whereabouts have been unknown. Your honor, I fancied... Well, I've done this thing. Anger determined me, and I denounced you to the prefet. And what answer did you get? That I was mad. Well? They were right. Javert, I am very lucky that you think so. Yes, Your Honor, it must be so. They found Jean Valjean. What? They've caught him, Your Honor. He's safe in prison. What do you mean, Javert? Who have they caught? Jean Valjean, Your Honor. But of course you wouldn't know. Of course. How do they know he's Jean Valjean? Very simple, Your Honor. He looks like him. Besides, he was recognized by an old galley slave in the jail. How did they catch him? Stealing apples, Your Honor. He called himself Chamatieu. He'd been a pruner and he'd lived at Favaro. 
Now, what was Jean Valjean? A pruner. Where? At Favreau. It's very simple, Your Honor. The same age, the same height. When I wrote to the justice, he sent for me and brought me before the man so much you. Well? Your Honor, truth is truth. I'm sorry for it, but that man is Jean Valjean. Are you sure of it? Yes, monsieur, I'm sure. And now that I see the real Jean Valjean, Your Honor, I don't see how I could ever have believed anything else. I beg your pardon. What did this man say to you? No, he's a sly one, Mr. Valjean. That's where I recognize him. He pretends not to understand. He puts on astonishment and plays innocent. But there's evidence. He'll be condemned. Where is he now? At the assizes at Ella. I've been summoned to testify. What's the charge? Stealing apples, Your Honor. Second offense. It's the galleys for life. When's the trial? Tomorrow. When do you leave? Tonight. As soon as I've given my testimony, I shall return. How long will the trial last? A day at the longest, Your Honor. I see. Your pardon, monsieur. Yes? I must be discharged. Gervais, uh, you're a man of honor. You may keep your place. You can't do that. You can't do that to me. Javert, this is a matter which concerns me alone. You can't do it. You're a mayor and a magistrate. You've got to discharge me. I belong to the police. You're respectable. You own property, and I denounced you. Don't you know what that means? You exaggerate your fault, Inspector. I forgive you. You've no right to. I don't want your forgiveness. Your forgiveness, your charity, your kindness. I hate your kindness. The kindness that defends a woman of the town against a citizen, an inferior against a superior, a police agent against the mayor. I hate that kindness. It's easy to be kind. It's hard to be just. If you'd been what I thought you were, I wouldn't have been kind to you, not I, Your Honor. I've said to myself, Javert, you're a hard man, but if you ever trip, look out. Well, I've tripped. I would have broken another man. I must be broken, stripped of my uniform, driven off, disgraced. You've got to do that to me. That's what's right. I demand my discharge. Well, Javert, let me think about it. After all, you may not be as wrong as you think. Give me your hand. Pardon, monsieur. That must not be. The mayor doesn't give his hand to a spy. Your Honor, I will continue in the service until I'm relieved. Now, Jean Valjean, called Madeleine, had forgotten a promise. There was a young girl, Fontaine. She was sick, and the good mayor had taken her from the streets and given her to the care of an old nun in his hospital. Here, Fontaine lay dying. Her only joy, the hope of seeing her child, her little daughter, whom she'd boarded with some innkeepers in another town. Monsieur Madeleine had promised to bring her child to her. Monsieur Madeleine. Monsieur Madeleine. Why don't you answer? There, there, Fontaine, my child. Lie back. <coughs> oh, sister, I, I must have been asleep. Where is he? Where's Monsieur Madeleine? The portress told me he could not come today. Oh, no. But he always comes. Always. Every day he comes here to the hospital to see me. Mademoiselle Fantine, be calm. You must lie down again. Why can't he come, sister? My child, the mayor has gone away. Gone away? Gone away? Yes. I know. He's gone for Cosette. I'm going to see her again. Remember, sister, what he said to me yesterday? Very, very soon, he said. Yes, my child. Oh, I am so happy. Why, well, I feel all well. No pain at all. I'm going to see my child again. Yes, but you mustn't talk anymore. It's been five years since I've seen her. I had to leave her with the innkeepers on the road when she was little. That was all I could do, sister. Because people talk and I, I needed a job to support us. Then there was no work and I had to do anything to pay for her board. I know. Uh, that's how I got in my trouble. <laughs> but Monsieur Madeleine was good to me. He, he saved me from jail. Uh, he, he's the mayor, and he can do that. And he saved me from that wicked policeman, Javert. And he's taking care of me in my sickness. And now he's gone to get Cosette from the innkeepers. And he'll bring her to me. I'm sure he will. And when Cosette comes, can she lie by my side in the little bed? Uh, you let her do that, won't you? Yes, my child. Good night. Then when she wakes... I can say good morning to her. And at night when I'm awake, I can hear her sleep. 
That little breathing is so sweet. Good night, my child. Good night, sister. Look, there's just room. There is one spectacle grander than the sea. That is the sky. There is one spectacle grander than the sky. That is the soul. Let us look into a soul. The soul of Jean Valjean called Madeleine, the mayor of Montreux. Jean Valjean, I gave you the candlesticks that you stole from me. I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from perversity, and I give it to Almighty God. I was wrong about you. They've got Jean Valjean. They're trying him tomorrow. It's the galleys for life. They've got Jean Valjean. Even while listening to the words of Javert, the first impulse of Jean Valjean was to drag this poor man out of prison and put himself in his place. An impulse as painful and sharp as an incision in the living flesh. But this impulse passed away. Well, well, what am I afraid of? This Javert who's troubled me. That fearful instinct which follows me, that terrible bloodhound, is baffled. He's satisfied. He'll leave me in quiet. He holds his Jean Valjean fast. And I have nothing to do with it. Why interfere? It doesn't concern me. I've brought happiness to this place. I've done some good. It is God's will that I do more. One can no more prevent the mind from returning to an idea than one can prevent the sea from coming to the shore. In the case of the sailor, this is called the tide. In the case of the guilty, this is called remorse. Fontaine. Fontaine. Remember Fontaine. That poor lonely woman who longs for her child. What of her? I have promised this mother her child. Who'll keep the promise? Well, well, this man goes to the galleys. What of it? He's stolen. Why say he hasn't stolen? He's stolen. And for me, I remain here. I go on. And this mother brings up her child, and the whole country is rich and happy and honest. I am Madeleine. Woe to him who is Valjean. I do not recognize the man. Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean. Behold yourself, Jean Valjean. An honored man. The mayor of the city. The rich man who feeds the poor. The happy man who is admired. Jean Valjean. There shall be a man wearing your red blouse and bearing your name and dragging your chain in the galleys. So struggled this unhappy soul. So struggled 1,800 years before him, another. He also while the olive trees were shivering in the fierce breath of the infinite, long put away the fearful chalice, dripping with shadow and running over with darkness in the star-filled depths. Who 
is it? I'm Monsieur Madeleine. Well, what is it? Monsieur Madeleine, it is just five o'clock. What's that to me? It's the cart, Monsieur. What cart? Did not Monsieur order a horse and cart? No. The driver says he has cut for you. Monsieur Madeleine. Monsieur Madeleine, what shall I say? Say, say it's all right. Say I'm coming. At daybreak, Jean Valjean was in the open country. The roads were bad from Montreux to Arras. When he got to the courthouse, it was night. Monsieur Madeleine. Yes? Oh, Your Honor, you should have told me straight off that you're the mayor of Montreux. A place has been made for you on the bench, Your Honor. The judge begs you to enter. Thank you. Not at all, Your Honor. You've only to turn the brass knob of that door and you'll find yourself in the courtroom. Good evening, monsieur. Jean Valjean was alone. He stared at the door to the courtroom. He drew breath and listened. There was no sound. He waited there... Listening. The same silence. He leaned against the wall. The stone was cold. He closed his eyes. Jean Valjean, there shall be a man bearing your name and dragging your chain in the galleys. He opened his eyes. The first thing he saw was the handle of that door. The door to the courtroom. That round, polished, brass handle. It shone there before him like a star. Then, suddenly, he was in the courtroom. Monsieur Madeleine? Yes, Excellency. That's my name. Your note was sent in to me, monsieur. Permit me to say that your presence in this court is an unexpected compliment. Thank you. I have not had the pleasure of your honor's acquaintance, but we all know by reputation, at least, Monsieur Madeleine, the distinguished mayor of Montreux. When you sit here, Monsieur Madeleine, we will resume the trial of Jean Valjean. He did not need to look for him. He saw him. This was the man... He thought he saw himself, older, but just as he'd looked, everything as it was, eight years before, early in October 1815, when he left the galleys and entered the little town of D. He thought he saw his trial, his trial, played by his shadow. Judges, clerks, gendarmes, a throng of heads... He'd seen all this before, 27 years before, when Jean Valjean was tried by law for stealing a loaf of bread. We will resume the trial of Jean Valjean. Monsieur Madeleine, the prisoner is accused of stealing ripe apples. (laughs) Your Excellency, the judge. Your Honor, Monsieur Madeleine. Gentlemen of the jury, who is this man? Gentlemen, we have here no petty truth thief, no mere trespasser. We have here an outlaw, a murderous galley slave. We have here Jean Valjean. This man is accused of one crime for which he is on trial, but he is wanted for another. Highway robbery committed for the gain of one penny from a small boy encountered in the fields outside of D. Convict him for the new crime, and he shall be tried again for the first. Prisoner, on your own behalf, have you anything to say? No, Excellency. No, I, I didn't do it, that's all. I, I never stole anything. I'm a man who doesn't get something to eat every day. I picked off the ground things that were there. That's all I did. You see, Monsieur Madeleine, there's no question of the identity. This man is obviously Jean Valjean. Has the prisoner no witnesses? May I question him? Oh, certainly, Monsieur. Thank you. Monsieur Chamatour, how long have you been a pruner? 
His honor is speaking to you, prisoner. Reply to him. I don't know, monsieur. I've been a pruner for a long time. Before that, I was a wheelwright. Yes, I I was a wheelwright in Paris. I I earned 30 sous a day. Look here. I'm telling the truth. You have only to ask if it isn't so. Ask how stupid I am. Ask anybody. (laughs) Ask! I don't know what you want of me. Your Excellency, I beg leave to call out at this time three witnesses. Brevet, Chanel Dieu, Cochepaille. They are convicts. They have been in the galleys with the accused. Permission granted. Call the first witness. Convict Brevet. Convict Brevet. Yes, sir. Come forward. Convict Brevet, you have suffered infamous punishment and cannot take the oath. Prisoner Champerthieu, rise. Rise, prisoner. Brevet, look upon the prisoner. Say on your soul and conscience whether you still recognize this man as your former fellow convict, Jean Valjean. Your Excellency, I remember him. Sit down, Brevet. Prisoner remains standing. Call out the galley slave, Chanel Dieu. Convict, Chanel Dieu. Yes, Your Excellency. Think carefully. Do you recognize this man? Recognize him? We were on the same chain together. What's wrong, Jack? Don't you remember me? Sit down, prisoner. Convict, Koshpai. Do you identify the man before you? That's 24601. Jean Valjean, his name was. Chamathieu, oh, yeah. you have heard the testimony of these witnesses. Have you anything to say? I say they're liars! Officers, in force order! I am about to pronounce sentence on this man. One moment! Order. Your Excellency! In order. Order. Your Excellency! May I be permitted a few words on behalf of the accused? <laughs> I'd like to tell you about Jean Valjean. Mr. Madeleine, you're a man of high office. I must grant your request. Excellency, they were right when they told you that Jean Valjean was an outlaw. It's true he was a galley slave. The convicts are right. Nineteen years he was chained between Cochepaille and Ocean Ildieu. Nineteen long years. It's true he was a criminal. The pennies were stolen and the loaf of bread. And the bishop was robbed. But mark you, gentlemen, the galleys make the galleys slave. Before the galleys, this man was a poor peasant, an idiot. He was changed in the galleys. He was stupid. He was made wicked. He was a log. He became a firebrand. He was saved later by indulgence and kindness as he was lost by severity. You won't understand this. There are some things which cannot be told. I cannot relate to you the story of Jean Valjean's life. Someday you will know it. He's done what he could. He's disguised himself under another name. He has desired to enter again among honest men. It seems this cannot be. Gentlemen, your prisoner is not he who is on trial before you. Release this man. He is innocent. What is done at this moment, God beholds from on high. This man is no convict, no outlaw, no thief. Gentlemen, I am Jean Valjean. Monsieur Madeleine is not well, officer. See his honor to my chamber. You don't believe me? Revy, shunny you, coast by, look at me. Do you recognize me? Do you know who I am? Revy! Answer me. Yes, Your Honor. Hello, 23709. Sean, is you number 21808? Your left shoulder still scarred from a burn. Answer me. Is that true? Yes, monsieur, it's true. Coach by number 24302. There's a date in blue letters on your left arm. March 1st, 1815. Lift up your sleeve. March 1st, 1815. <laughs> Gentlemen, you see clearly. I am Jean Valjean. You may arrest me when you choose. Good night, gentlemen. Official order delivered under seal. Inspector Javert will seize the body of Monsieur Madeleine, the mayor of Montreux, who has this day been identified in court as the discharged convict and criminal Jean Valjean. Sister, let me in. Your hair. Your hair, monsieur. It is all white. Catherine, can I see her? Oh, have you brought back her child? Oh, monsieur, she is asleep. I must see her tonight now. 
There's no time. Is she mad, Lynn? Oh, you have awakened oh. her. My dear little Fontaine. I knew you were there. I was asleep, but I saw you. I followed you with my eyes the whole night. Tell me, where is my Cosette? Sister, you said I might have her in a little bed beside me. Not yet, my child. You still have some fever. We must cure you first. But I am cured. Let me see my Cosette. Isn't it natural I should want to see my child when you've been to all that trouble to get her? If you bring her in to see me now, I'll speak very gently. It is better to wait, Fontaine. Oh, Oh, monsieur. Only tell me, how is she? She may not know me. Children have no memories. They're like birds. You must be cold, Monsieur Madeleine, after that trip in the carriage. Oh, could they not bring her here for one... Cosette is well. Cosette is beautiful. He will see her soon. But be quiet. Do you hear me, Fontaine? What's wrong with you, child? Monsieur. He has come for me. The policeman. Fontaine. What are you looking at? But Inspector Javert. Well, Jean Valjean. I know what he wants, child. It's not for you that he comes. Come on, Jean Valjean. Monsieur Medlin. Monsieur Madeleine, save me. There's no Madeleine here. There is Jean Valjean. One moment, Chevalier. Call me, Inspector. Inspector, I'd like a word with you in private. Speak aloud. People speak aloud to me. Monsieur Madeleine. It's a request I have to make to you. Speak aloud, I tell you. Inspector, this is not to be heard by anyone but yourself. What's that to me? My Cosette. Cosette. I'll never see her. Listen to me. You've got to. You're human. Give me just three days. Three days to go for the child of this woman. You're clever, Jean Valjean. I'll say that for you. You asked me for three days to get away, and you tell me you're going for a child. Going for a child? My child? Cosette? Then she's not here. Monsieur Madeleine, where is Cosette? I want my child. My Cosette. Monsieur Madeleine. Hold your tongue, husband. I want my child. Miserable country where galley slaves are magistrates and women of the town are nursed like countesses. All this will be changed. Monsieur Madeleine. I tell you, there is no Madeleine. There is a robber. There is a brigand. There is a convict. There is Jean Valjean. And I've got him. Don't be afraid, little Fontaine. 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 What's wrong with her sister? Requiem my turn, I'm Donna Ace. Come on. Come on. What's wrong with her? Can't you see the woman is dead? I am at your disposal. Requiem my turn, I'm Donna Ace. Domine. Tonight, WOR and the Mutual Network have brought you part three of Victor Hugo's absorbing masterpiece, Les Miserables the episode which pictured the death of Fontaine and the capture of the supposed Jean Valjean. Orson Welles played the roles of both the real and the supposed Valjean and was also heard reading the narrative passages of this presentation, which he has made especially for radio. Assisting Mr. Welles were Martin Gable as Javert, Alice Frost as Fontaine, Ray Collins, Adelaide Klein, William Johnstone, and Hiram Sherman. The orchestra was under the direction of Milton Catums, who arranged the score. Next Friday evening at 10 o'clock... We shall present Les Miserables in its fourth chapter, the episode which is called Cosette. This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System. Miserable, part four, the episode which is called Cosette. (laughs) 
Jean Valjean, you are a hardened criminal and a second offender. You are charged with concealing your identity and changing your name. How do you plead? Guilty. You are so found by this court. Jean Valjean, you are sentenced to hard labor in the galleys under the double chain for the rest of your life. The notebook of Inspector Javert, July 1823. I have caught Jean Valjean. In a whole lifetime of service with the police, there is no entry in this book which has occasioned me so much satisfaction. I have caught Jean Valjean. I am affixing to this page an excerpt from a recent newspaper in Paris. Here it is. The Paris Journal, July 25th, 1823. An old convict has been brought to trial called Jean Valjean. The circumstances are extraordinary. In the district of Montreux, a gentleman called Monsieur Madeleine had, in acknowledgement of his services, been appointed mayor. And as such, he was famed for his wisdom and his good works. But this man has been unmasked. The police authorities, thanks chiefly to the zeal of Inspector Javert, have disclosed the true identity of Monsieur Madeleine. He is none other than the convict, Jean Valjean. It appears that previous to his arrest, this man had succeeded in withdrawing from his bank a sum amounting to more than 500,000 francs, which he had deposited there and which, it is said, he had realized in his business. Since his return to the galleys, it has been impossible to discover where this money has been concealed. This is the end of the newspaper article. I think I can guess the motive of Jean Valjean in concealing this money. His hope of escape. And there's another matter. The child, Cosette. The child of the woman, Fantine. It was this Fantine whom I apprehended on the street and who Valjean, in the character of the mayor, protected from justice and in the compassion of one criminal for another, nursed through the illness from which she died. This child was abandoned at an early age to the care of some innkeeper. If I know Jean Valjean, the purpose of this money is the care of this child. I must find this corsette. November 17, 1823. Here is an excerpt from the Toulon Journal. Yesterday, a convict at work on board the galley ship Orient on his return from rescuing a sailor fell overboard and was drowned. His body has not been recovered. This man was registered under the number 9430 and his name is Jean Valjean. This finishes it. The case is closed. Jean Valjean is dead. Tonight, we are to consider the story of Cosette. Cosette. Fantine had left her at Montfermier with some innkeepers called the Tenadiers. The little Cosette, the child of Fantine. Jean Valjean had promised to care for Cosette. Javert never found her. Now, who were these innkeepers, these Tenadiers? This man and this woman were cunning and rage married. A hideous and terrible pair. Cosette was between them, undergoing their double pressure. Like a creature who was at the same time bruised by a millstone and lacerated with pincers. The man and woman had each a different way. Cosette was beaten unmercifully. That came from the woman. She went barefoot in winter... That came from the man, a ferocious mistress, a malignant master, a rascal of the subdued order. Tanadier's code as an innkeeper is interesting. The duty of the innkeeper is to sell to the first comer. Food, rest, light, fire, dirty linen, servants, fleas and smiles, to charge for the open window, the closed window, the chimney corner, the sofa, the chair, the stool, the bench, the feather bed, the mattress, the straw bed. To know how much the mirror is worn and to tax that. To make the traveler pay for everything even to the flies that his dog eats. Cosette was their only servant. And this child of eight did the work of a full staff. She brushed, scrubbed, swept, ran errands, lifted heavy things, puny as she was. And the moment the poor girl wearied in her back-breaking tasks, the huge figure of Madame Tanadier loomed above her, shrilling commands through the inn. Cosette! Cosette! Oh, there you are! Well, what have you been doing? Nothing as usual. You know we need more wood for the kitchen. Get it. There, that'll teach you to waste time. (laughs) 
Christmas Eve, 1823. Pretty windows, candy booths, toy stores, parties and good things to eat. Little shoes at the fireplace for Father Christmas to fill. Christmas Eve. Festivity in the little town of Montfermeil. Extra work at the inn. Extra work for Cosette. <laughs> you girl, have you watered my horse? Oh, yes, monsieur. He drank the whole bucket full. Ah, that's a lie. He has a way of blowing off when he's not had water that I know well enough. Get some right, more right. water, Cosette. Excuse me, ma'am. There is no water. Well, then go get some. Oh, where must you go for it? To the spring. But it's night. It's as black as an oven. Yes, yes. It would take a cat to go along the streets without a lantern tonight. <laughs> She'll go. She can see. Here, mademoiselle, get a big loaf of the baker's as you come back. Here's 15 sous. Yes, madame. Now get along with you. The child fled with her bucket, running as fast as she could. The night was cold, and the spring was far away. Soon, the gleam from the town disappeared, and the darkness became thicker. It was no longer Montfermeil. It was open country. Dark, terrifying country. The child's heart pounded at her ribs. With their ghosts moving in the trees, time after time she faltered and started back towards the inn. But always there appeared to her the more dreadful specter of Madame Ternardier, and she went on. At length she arrived at the spring. Cosette did not take time to breathe. She felt in the darkness for a young oak, which bent over the spring, found a branch, swung herself from it, bent down and plunged the bucket in the water. In that movement, she did not notice that her apron pocket emptied itself into the spring. The 15 sous piece fell from her dress and dropped into the water. Cosette neither saw nor heard the coin fall. She was anxious to start back at once. But the effort of filling the bucket had been so great that it was impossible for her to take a step. For on this night, this starless, terrifying Christmas night, that bucket was heavier than ever before. The woods were blacker. The wind was colder. The child tugged at the stooping weight and managed a few steps. Terror gripped her. Terror. Terror of something she couldn't see. She began to count aloud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three. She had to go on, if only for a few steps at a time. She walked on, bending down like an old woman. The iron handle of the bucket was numbing and freezing her little wet hands. On and on, a step at a time. Madame would beat her. Madame would scream at her. Madame would whip her. All at once, the weight of the bucket was gone. A hand had caught the handle and was carrying it easily. Cosette raised her head and saw a large, dark form beside her in the gloom. And she was not afraid. Oh, thank you, monsieur. My child, that's... That's a heavy bucket you're carrying there. Yes, monsieur. Give it to me. I'll carry it for you. Here we are. It's very heavy indeed. You're a little girl for such a big bucket. How old are you? Eight years. Have you come far this way? From the spring in the woods. Are you going far? Oh, yes, monsieur. A good quarter of an hour from here. Little girl. Yes, monsieur. Have you no mother? I don't know, monsieur. I don't think I have. All the rest have one. For my part, I have none. I don't believe I ever had any. What's your name? 
Cosette. Where do you live? At Montfermeil. Oh, is, is that where we're going? Yes, monsieur. Who is it that sent you out to the woods? After water, at this time of night? Madame Tanadier. Oh. And what does she do, Madame Tanadier? She is my mistress. She keeps the tavern. The tavern? Well, well, I'm going there to lodge tonight. Show me the way. Monsieur, we are going there. Look, we're on the main street. How far is the inn? We are close by it. Monsieur, may I take the bucket now? What for? Because if Madame Tenardier sees that if anybody else brought it for me, she will beat me. <laughs> oh, not on Christmas, my child. Is this Christmas, monsieur? Oh, it's you, is it? Well, you've taken your time. Madame, here is a gentleman who is coming to love. What? Oh, monsieur, come in. Have you a room? Uh, my brave man, I'm sorry, but I have nothing. Put me anywhere. In the garret or in the stable. I would pay as if I had a room. Forty sous? Very well. Forty sous. In advance, I don't lodge poor people for less. <laughs> I shall want some supper. If you are prepared to pay, monsieur, very well. Oh, I forgot the bread. Cosette! Cosette! Oh, madame, the baker was closed. You ought to have knocked. I did knock, madame, but he didn't do it. I'll find out tomorrow if that's true, and if you're lying... Well, give me back the 15 sous. Come, don't you hear me? Have you lost it or did you steal it from me? Well, answer. It's gone, madame. Forgive me, please, madame. Oh, so you lost it. It must have slipped from my pocket at the spring. Oh, madame, it won't ever happen again. I should say not. I'll teach you to lose my money. Where's that whip? No, no, madame. Don't whip me, please. Madame. Don't whip me, madame. Madame. I beg your pardon. But I just saw something fall out of the little girl's pocket and roll away. This may be it. Here it is. A 20 sou piece? Yes. Isn't that what you gave her? Why, yes. Yes, that's it. Of course, that you'll never let that happen again. Get to work. Now, monsieur, let me show you to your own. Late that night, the stranger went to bed. Not in the stable as he had expected, but in the best room of the inn. This courtesy on the part of the Tanadiers had, as usual, a purpose behind it. A purpose which the irritable Madame Tanadier could hardly understand. The fool! What was in his head to protect that little monster Cosette? To pretend she lost the 20 sous beats? Think of that! That slut I wouldn't give ten sous for. It's very simple. It amused him. He has the right to do it if he can pay for it. Why interfere as long as he has money? No matter what you say, I'm going to kick Cosette out of doors tomorrow. You are indeed. Yes, madame. I'm going away. Monsieur, then, has no business in Montfermeil. No, no, I have not. Uh, do you do a good business here, madame? Mm, so, so, monsieur. It is a very little place, as you see, and we have so many expenses. I had a little girl eat us out of house and home. Uh, what little girl? Why, the little girl, you know, Cosette. Well, madame, suppose you were relieved of her. Cosette? <laughs> Oh, monsieur, take her, keep her, carry her, stuff her, drink her, eat her, and be blessed by all the things. Agreed. Really? You will take her away? I will, immediately. Call the child. Cosette! Uh, where is my bill? How much is uh, it? Here it is, monsieur. You owe us 23 francs. Ah, Tanadje, what news? He's going to take that beggar Cosette off my hands. I shall go fetch her at once. Cosette! Uh, 23 francs, you said. Uh, here you are, monsieur. 
Pardon, monsieur. There is an extra charge for your candle. That will be two francs more. Oh, thank you, monsieur. As to the little girl, I must have some talk with you about that. Well, your wife seems anxious enough to get rid of her. Uh, that may be, monsieur. But I must say that I adore the girl. What? You wish to take our little uh, Cosette from us. I'm afraid, monsieur, I cannot consent to that. It is true the child costs us money. It is true the child has faults. But we love her. We must all do something for God. After all, one does not give his child to the first traveler, you understand? I do not even know your name. Now, if I were to see perhaps some paper you have, a passport, perhaps? Uh, Monsieur Tanadier, people do not take a passport to come five leagues from Paris. If I take Cosette, I take her. That is all. You will not know my name or my abode. You will not know where she goes. And my intention is that she shall never see you again in all her life. Do you agree? Yes or no? In that case, monsieur, I must have 1,500 francs. I was prepared for this. 1,500 francs. There it is. Come along, dear. You're not frightened of me, are you? Here she is, monsieur. Wrap yourself up, child. It's cold, and we're going away. Wait, monsieur, my money. I've given you 1,500 francs, monsieur Tenadier. You have your money. Come, Cosette. <laughs> what luck, husband. He has taken the little wretch, and we have 1,500. Ah, don't be a fool. We might have had thousands. Why did he come here for the ugly brat? Who is he? In heaven's name, who is that man? Who was that man? He was Jean Valjean. In his fall overboard from the Orion... The sea had been kind to him. The sea had hid him from the galley guards. The sea which was supposed to have closed the case in Inspector's notebook. Number 9430 was very much alive. So Jean Valjean took Cosette away with him to Paris. Jean Valjean had never loved anything. He had never been father, lover, husband or friend. To teach Cosette and to watch her playing was nearly all his life. And then he would talk to her about her mother and teach her to pray. It is very sweet, this grand and strange emotion of the heart in its first love. Poor old heart, so young. And for Cosette, from the first day, everything that she felt in her being... Love this kind old friend. She called him father and knew him by no other name. Now Jean Valjean was cautious. He never left the house in Paris by day, keeping prudently to the infrequented side alleys of the neighborhood. He would walk sometimes an hour or two at nightfall. Now there was in that district an old beggar who sat crouched on the edge of a condemned well those who were envious of this poor creature said he was in the pay of the police. He was an old church beadle of 75, who was always mumbling prayers. Jean Valjean never passed him without giving him a few pennies. One evening, toward the close of winter, as he was passing that way, he noticed this beggar crouched in his usual place under the street lamp. The man, according to his custom, seemed to be praying and was bent over. Jean Valjean walked up to him and put a piece of money in his hand. The beggar suddenly raised his eyes and stared into his face. Then he quickly dropped his head. It was over in a moment. But Jean Valjean shuddered. It seemed to him that he had seen by the light of the street lamp not the calm, sanctimonious face of the old beadle, but a terrible and well-known countenance. Some instinct kept Jean Valjean from speaking. He gazed at the crouching figure. The same form, the same rags as on the other day. He told himself he was mad. And he hurried home. T-R-E-E. -E. 
see the bird in the tree. T H E. What's that? What is it, Father? Quiet. It's someone in the hall, Father. Who is it? Lie down, dear, and don't talk. He stopped, Father. He's just outside the door. Father, why are you blowing out the light? Father. Little one, you must go to sleep. Yes, Father. But what does he want out Please. there? Please. Please, Cosette. Yes, Father. Paris, tonight. Has it something to do with that man in the hall, Father? Father, what was he doing? Peeking in? Do you know him? I know him. What's his name, Father? His name is Javert. Through the sleeping city, through the narrow, silent streets, running, creeping, doubling, backing, Describing a hundred sly patterns in the labyrinth of back courts and alleys and passageways, ran these two hunted beings, the old convict who had been a mayor of a city, the little child who had been a slave, frightened, breathless, unspeaking, fleeing the terrible policeman, fleeing Javert. He came to a blind alley. There were high walls there. And to the left, at the corner where a street began, Jean Valjean saw a sentinel. He felt as if caught by a chain that was slowly winding up. At this moment, a muffled and regular sound began to make itself heard at some distance. Soldiers. Jean Valjean saw the gleam of their bayonets. They were coming towards him. They came slowly stopping to examine the recesses of the walls, to search the entrances of doors and alleys. Javert led the way. There was only one thing possible. In the prison ships, the old convict had learned a strange art, the art of climbing without ladders or ropes, of supporting himself by the back of his neck, his shoulders, his hips, and his knees. The art of raising himself straight up the right angle of a wall to the height of a sixth story. Jean Valjean looked up the wall and measured the distance with his eyes. About 18 feet. The difficulty was Cosette. He needed a rope. Where could he find a rope? At midnight, on a deserted street. Then, Jean Valjean saw the street lamp. Now, at that time, there were no gas lamps in the streets of Paris. The lamps were raised and lowered by cords. Traversing the street from one end to the other were these cords. The wheel on which the rope was wound was locked below the lantern in a little iron box. Jean Valjean sprang the bolt of this box and an instant after was back at the side of Cosette. He had a rope. A half minute and Jean Valjean was on the top of the wall. Another and he'd pulled a Cosette. The next instant they were safe. Safe on the other side. That's the blind alley. He's got to be there. That's that. He can't finish. He can't that. He can't fight. That's what he's got to be there. Oh, 
Father? Yes, Cosette? Can I talk now? Yes, little one. Father, where are we? What is this place? I don't know, my child. Father, how long will it be till Javert finds us here? He won't find us here. Of Inspector Javert, January 9th, 1818. This is the anniversary of Jean Valjean's escape. This is the date of my failure. This is the day when Jean Valjean eluded me and vanished almost before my eyes in a closed and guarded street. To think that this man is free, alive somewhere in the world, and laughing at justice. But give justice time. I can wait. I have waited before. I can watch. Jean Valjean is my man. Someday I will catch him. W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have brought you part four of Victor Hugo's absorbing masterpiece, Les Miserables, the episode which was called Cosette. Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director, played the role of Jean Valjean and was also heard reading the narrative passages which bound together the dramatic action. Assisting Mr. Welles were Martin Gable as Javert, Estelle Levy as Cosette, Agnes Moorhead, Ray Collins, William Johnstone, and Hiram Sherman. Next Friday evening at 10 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time, we shall present Les Miserables in its fifth phase, the episode which is called Marius. This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System. Part 5, the episode which is called The Gray. Oh! 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 Who goes there? Police Lieutenant on special duty for Inspector Javert. Any news of Jean Valjean? Have you caught him? Caught him? <laughs> we thought we caught him. Ah, just look. Bright moonlight. Twenty-four of us. A whole street full of police. A blind alley and Javert himself. And would you believe it, Lieutenant? He got away. <laughs> I'll bet Javert's boiling. Where is he now? Out in the fields with the first squad. Javert swears he'll find him if it takes every policeman in Paris. He hates that man so much it frightens him. Uh, there's something between those two that's worse than hate. Whatever it was, it happened years ago when Javert was an inspector in some town in the south and this Jean Valjean was the mayor. Valjean, the mayor? Oh, yes. Made his fortune in business, he did. And still has the money somewhere, hidden away. He called himself Monsieur Madeleine in those days. Ah, but you can't fool Javert. Javert found him out and sent him back to the galley ship. The double chain. How did Valjean get out of that? Now, how did he get out of this tonight? And mark you, Lieutenant, this time he had a child with him. Yes. Javert has spoken of that child. Yes. The offspring of some criminal woman, Jean Van Jean, protected from Javert when he was mayor. It is very sordid. But where did they go? Where could they go? Look about you, Lieutenant. Where is there room for an old man and a little child? What's beyond those walls? Oh, what does it matter? No living man could climb those walls. These things are not to be understood. The convict has vanished, and there's an end to it. And if I know Jean Valjean, he won't be caught. Yes, my friend. But if I know Javert, you'll go on hunting him. 
Trapped in a closed street. Pursued and surrounded. But Jean Valjean had escaped. Javert had found him out in his hiding place and chased him that night across the city of Paris till he came to this blind alley. A squad of police, a lone man, and a little child. Where was this Jean Valjean? No living man could climb those walls. But there are things to be learned in 19 years' service in the galleys. And Jean Valjean had learned in those years the dark sciences of the impossible. Pulling Cosette up after him, he had climbed one of those walls. He found himself in a garden, a wild and solitary place, black in the shadow of an enormous and shuttered building. What was this house? Wrapped snugly in his greatcoat, Cosette, the little child, soon fell asleep. And Jean Valjean, watching over her, knew that night that so long as this child should be alive, he should need nothing except for her and fear nothing save on her account. He heard a strange noise, a sound like a bell shaking on the neck of a beast. There was something in the garden, something limping in the darkness, and like a man. To the outcast, all things are hostile, and all things are suspicious. He distrusts the day because it helps to discover him, and the night because it helps to surprise him. Jean Valjean shuddered because the garden was empty. Now he shuddered because someone was there. There was no hiding in that garden. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh, what is it? Oh, you frightened me. Who are you? A hundred francs if you'll hide me. Oh, oh God help us. Monsieur Manley. What? Monsieur, monsieur, how did you get here? How did you fall from the sky? Who are you? Don't you remember old Forcival? You once saved my life. Forcival? Six years ago, monsieur, you lifted my great wagon from the mud. I was caught there. I would have been crushed, monsieur Manley. Yes, yes. Fauchelevent, the wagoner. And you, you remember only Monsieur Madeleine, the mayor of Montreux. Yes, yes. And what is the mayor doing here? Fauchelevent, I'm in trouble. You must hide me. Oh, not here, monsieur. No man is allowed here. No one will know. Oh, monsieur Madeleine, you have arrived at a very good time. I should say very bad. There is one of the sisters dangerously sick. She is dying. Oh. Father, I'm frightened. Corset, little one, go back to sleep. There's nothing to be afraid of. Monsieur, why do you wear that bell on your knee? They put it on me, my child, so they know when I'm coming. Fauchelevent, what is this place? Oh, don't you know, Monsieur Madeleine? You sent me here. It was your recommendation that got me the job as gardener, Monsieur. It's a convent. A convent? Yes, Monsieur, the convent of the perpetual adoration and a young lady's school. But how did you get here? Old friend, let it go that I fell from the sky. Well, I believe it, monsieur. You don't need to tell me. I believe it. God must have taken you into his own hand to have a close look at you and then put you down. Only he meant to put you in a monastery and he made a mistake. Listen, the nun is dead. Oh, father. Shush, Cosette. What is that bell? It is the death bell. That bell will strike every minute for 24 hours until the body goes out of the church. You hear it? It's like I told you, a stroke every minute. It is the rule of the convent. Fauchelevent, what do you do here? I am the gardener, monsieur. A gardener? Of course. Fauchelevent, I'm in danger. Oh. Will you save my life? Oh, ask me anything on earth. Give me a job. A job, Monsieur Madeleine? You, the mayor of Montreal? Forget Monsieur Madeleine. I must have a job. I must stay here. No one must see me. Don't you see? This convent would save us. Oh, but the little girl, Monsieur. Cosette shall be entered into the school. Please, old friend, make me your assistant in the garden. Present me as your brother. The Reverend Mother might consent. 
<laughs> but there, there is one thing. You see, monsieur, the gates are locked. The mother, the mother prioress will want to know how you got into the garden, and monsieur, I won't be able to tell her. What do you mean? You can't enter the convent from here, monsieur. They must admit you from the street. From the street? No. No, there, there must be some other way. Oh, no, there is no other way, and here's the difficulty. The porter, not me, unlocks the gates. In order for you to come in, it is necessary that you should get out. For me, you have fallen from heaven because I know you. But for the nuns, you must come in at the door. I see. For the child, it would be easy. I have my door, which opens to the court. I knock, the porter opens. I have my basket on my back. The little girl is inside. I go out. It's all very simple, monsieur. Very simple, monsieur Madeline, except for you. Well, can't you smuggle me out some way? Like a set? Undercover? It's not possible, monsieur. <laughs> <laughs> There's the bells for me. It's the Reverend Mother. She wants to see me. I wonder why. Monsieur Madeleine, don't stir from this shed. It's worth your life. I'm coming. I'm coming. Wait a moment. Reverend Mother, you sent for me? Reverend Mother... At a quarter to nine in the morning, and at all hours, praise and adoration to the most holy sacrament of the altar. Monsieur Fauchelevent, I have called you. I am here, Reverend Mother. I wish to speak to you. And for my part, I have nothing to say to the most Reverend Mother, uh, but something. You have a communication you wish to make to me. Reverend Mother, I am not young. No, monsieur. No, Reverend Mother. And I have also a brother who is not young. Indeed, monsieur. Not young. And not old. An excellent gardener, honest and respectable, and the father of a little girl who would be reared under God in this house and may someday be a nun. Monsieur Fauchelevent, can you, between now and night, procure an iron bar? For what work? To be used as a lever. Oh, yes, Reverend Mother, and may I say further that I have served here in the convent too long with this bell on my knee not to have an excellent brother. Monsieur Fauchelevent, we have confidence in you. You know that a mother died here this morning. Yes, Reverend Mother, amen. It is Mother Crucifixion, one of the blessed. Yes, Reverend Mother, and now she's dead. At nine o'clock in the morning and at all hours. Praise and adoration to the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen. Mother Crucifixion will be buried in the coffin in which she slept for 20 years. Yes, I will nail her up then and we'll put aside the undertaker's coffin. The four mother choristers will help you. Well, to nail up the coffin, I don't need them. No. To let it down. Where? Under the altar. Oh, the vault under the altar? We must obey the dead. To be buried in the vault under the altar, the altar of the chapel, not to go into profane ground, to remain in death where she prayed in life, that was the last request of Mother Crucifixion. She asked for it. But it's forbidden. Forbidden by men and joined by God. If it should come to be known. We have confidence in you. But Reverend Mother is the agent of the health commission. God subordinated to the commissary of police. Such is the case. Is it settled? It is settled, but I limp, I need help. To limp is not a crime, and it may be a blessing. Monsieur Fauchelevent, I am satisfied with you. Tomorrow, after the burial, bring your brother to me. Yes, Reverend Mother. And his daughter also. We will admit her to the school. At 9.15 in the morning, and at all hours... Praise and adoration to the most holy sacrament of the altar. Uh, so you see, Monsieur Madeleine, that's that's the only thing wrong with the whole idea. The government coffin. <laughs> government coffin. The coffin from the administration. You see, Monsieur Madeleine, when a nun dies, the municipality physicians uh, come and say, there is a nun dead. The government sends us a coffin, and the next day a hearse and some bearers to take it to the cemetery. The bearers will come tomorrow, and there'll be nothing in the coffin. Put something in it. A dead body? I have none. Put me in the coffin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Monsieur Madeleine, put you in the coffin. <laughs> I've got to get out of here. And I mustn't be seen. Oh, monsieur, it's impossible. Suppose you should sneeze. First of all, I must decide now either to be taken here or to go out in that hearse. There's only one thing that worries me. What will be done at the cemetery? Oh, I could handle the grave digger. He's a drunkard and a very close friend of mine by the name of Mestier. If he's not drunk tomorrow, I'll make him drunk and do his work for him. And when he goes away, I'll pull you out of the hole. That's simple. Then it's settled. All goes well. I get out of my coffin. And you get me out of my grave. Buried alive. Jean Valjean had arranged his coffin so he could live in it and breathe a very little. He was calm. He counted on that drunken gravedigger, old Fauchelevent's friend, the gravedigger, Mestien. The plans were perfect. They would take him in the coffin to the graveyard, thinking he was the nun. The priests would read the services and go away. Then Fauchelevent would take this Mestien to a tavern, and Jean Valjean would be left in the grave. He would wait patiently. Then Fauchelevent would return, alone, and he would be released. He was confident of the result. The four boards of the coffin exhaled a kind of terrible peace. It was as if something of the repose of the dead had entered into the tranquility of Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean felt himself lifted by the pallbearers. He felt himself thrown into the hearse. He felt it start. He felt himself driven from the clattering pavement of the streets to the hard ground of the boulevards, out to the open country and the grave. The boards of his coffin were thin, and Jean Valjean, lying there, could hear clearly what was spoken above him. Pull up! Pull up! Rain in, driver, let me on! Who are you? I'm the grave digger. The, the grave digger? You? The grave digger, me. Let me on. The grave digger is Father Monsieur. The grave digger was Monsieur. He is dead. I am the grave digger. I tell you the grave digger is Father Monsieur. After Napoleon Louis XVIII. After Monsieur Gribier. Peasant, my name is Gribier. Oh, so uh, Monsieur is, is dead, is he? Oh, uh, uh, let's uh, go have a drink. I never drink. Comrade, uh, I am the grave digger of the convent. My colleague, I salute you. Uh, let's uh, have a drink. I have studied. I have graduated. I never drink. Uh, <coughs> Comrade grave digger, we must uh, make each other's acquaintance. It is made. You are a peasant. I am a Parisian. Yes, I, uh, I don't think you know, my comrade, how important it is that we know each other very well. Oh, very well indeed, comrade. Over a glass of something wrong. I have told you, peasants, I never drink. Please, comrade grave digger. I ought not to be a grave digger. I was intended for literature. Indeed, peasants, I am still a public scribe. You are not the grave digger? One does not prevent the other, peasants. I accumulate. Good. Uh, let's uh, have a drink. Let's have a drink. Let's have a drink. Ding, dong, ding, dong, liquor, liquor. Have you no other topic of conversation? I'm a superior man, peasants. By day, I am a letter writer. I am the scribe of our most prominent bakers and cooks. In the morning, I write love letters. In the evening, I dig grave. Such is life. Uh, just one little good strong drink. Business first. What? Here we are at the graveyard. Here is the good priest and his choir boy waiting for the performance of the last rites. And here is my beautiful fresh grave. Come, peasants, lend a hand with this cough. Every word. Clearly. Jean Valjean could hear clearly what was spoken above him. Jean Valjean 
ut videam semper, le profundis requiem eternam donae domine, et lux perpetua luceat ei, requiescat in pace. Amen. Jean Valjean heard suddenly a sound above his head, which seemed to him like a clap of thunder. It fell on the coffin lid over his face. It was earth, earth from a spade. Four inches from his face, they were burying him. It stopped up the air holes. He couldn't breathe. the street where the convict, Jean Valjean, had disappeared. A hearse came out of the convent and passed Javert on its way to the cemetery. An old gardener came out of the convent and passed Javert carrying a covered basket. This gardener returned to the convent with another old man and a little child. He passed Javert in a carriage. For three months, Inspector Javert watched that street, and then he went away. In the convent, all was peace. The community was grateful for the services of its gardener. His niece was admitted to the school, and his brother was given a post as his assistant. So all went well for Jean Valjean. The years passed by. Cosette growing up in the school, Jean Valjean close to her in the convent garden and watching her as she grew. And so she grew. When Cosette was 14, Jean Valjean withdrew her from the convent school. He took a little house for her in the outskirts of the city, and they lived there together, very quietly. Perhaps the police 
had forgotten Jean Valjean. Perhaps Javert had stopped watching. You have an interesting story, monsieur. Now, what is your name again? This is simply for the record. Marius. Marius Pont Merci. Age? Twenty. Occupation? I'm a student. When did you meet this girl, Cosette? And why have you come here to the police? I saw her first three years ago in the Luxembourg. She used to walk there with the old gentleman, her guardian. And I've come to you because she's disappeared. Is the house empty where this couple lived? Deserted. You've searched for them and inquired after them diligently. And their whereabouts are unknown. What do you suspect? Well, I don't know. The old gentleman was eccentric. Explain yourself. Well, he kept strangely to himself. He never left the house except at nightfall. It was almost as though... Well... As though we were hiding from someone. And the girl, Cosette? She is quiet, monsieur, but very beautiful. I see. When you last saw this Cosette, did she speak to you of anything untoward? Can you remember any circumstance which struck you as peculiar? Yes, monsieur. The old gentleman seemed frightened. Frightened of what? Well, I... I can't explain it, monsieur. There was a man. A man Cosette had seen, or, or thought she'd seen... Standing on the edge of the garden. The old gentleman seemed to be frightened of that man. Did you see this man? I don't know. I saw a shadow. If it was a man, he was big like yourself, monsieur. And I don't know how he got there or how he moved so quietly. Cosette said that he wore a long gray coat and a, and a fat hat and carried a stick. I remember her telling monsieur Fauchelevent. Is that what he calls himself? What did you say, monsieur? Hmm? Uh, nothing. How long afterward did they disappear? Why, they must have left that night, monsieur, when I'd gone home. It's it's five weeks now since I've seen her. Monsieur Marius, don't trouble yourself any further. Your loved one shall be returned to you. I will look for that girl, and I will look for that man. I will look very carefully for that man, and I will find him. If you hear anything else, please notify me at once here at police headquarters. My name is Javert. Good day, monsieur. W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have brought you part five of Victor Hugo's absorbing masterpiece, Les Miserables, the episode which was called The Grave. Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director, played the role of Jean Valjean and was also heard reading the narrative passages. Assisting Mr. Welles were Martin Gable as Javert, Ray Collins as Fauchelevent, William Johnstone as Marius, Peggy Allenby, Virginia Wells, Estelle Levy, Hiram Sherman, and Everett Sloan. Next Friday evening at 9.30 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Saving Time, we shall present Les Miserables in its sixth phase, the episode which is called The Barricade. This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System. The story of Jean Valjean and Inspector Javert. The episode which is called The Barricade. Official order delivered under seal, March 9th, 1821. Inspector Javert will seize the body of Monsieur Madeleine, the mayor of Montreux, who has identified himself this day in court 
as the discharged convict Jean Valjean. Six times from the galleys, twice from the double chain and twice from under my grasp. Last night he escaped from me. We had him, my men and I, and he gave us the slip. Then we had him again. We hunted him through the city. His flight was embarrassed by the child, Cosette, whom he carried in his arms. We were on every side of him. The walls were too high to climb. He was surrounded. He was trapped in a closed and guarded street. And he disappeared. Jean Valjean has escaped. 1832. Sedition, mutiny, rebellion. These are dangerous times. Never before has the vandalism and the lawlessness of the mob had such reign. The very government is in peril, and there are whispers of another revolution in France. We of the police are wakeful and vigilant. Here in Paris, the riotings of the people, led by some party of young fanatics, has grown to downright insurrection. And I have today intelligence of a barricade to be erected in a certain section of the city. True or no, this rumor is worthy of attention, and I'm going there in disguise to mingle with the revolutionaries. Today, June 6th, is the anniversary of Jean Valjean's escape. It's the date of my failure as a police officer. Thirty years now I've been in this service. All this time, I've devoted to police duty the strictest honesty and watchfulness and discipline. I've given it my mind, my heart and my hope. I've made it my whole life. But so long as this man, Valjean, remains alive and free in the world, my purpose is thwarted. My honor is a joke. For this Jean Valjean has become a principle in the order of my code. He is all that must be checked. He is crime. Worse than that, he is license. It's 12 years since I've seen him. I shall see him again. I shall know him when I see him. And he shall not escape. Once Valjean forgave me, I shall not forgive him. Corset. Corset, is something wrong? Corset! Yes? May I come in? Yes, Father. My little one, you haven't stirred from your room this whole day. Now tell me something. What's on that pretty cheek? I don't know. Well, I do. It's a tear, and it has no business there. You've been weeping a great deal. Tell me, what for? For him. What's his name? Marius. Marius Pomerci. Tell me about him. We met at the Luxembourg. He's going to be killed. Father, why have they made that barricade? For protection, my child, it's a... It's a kind of fort for the revolutionaries. Marius is at the barricade. How do you know? He was a rebel. He pledged himself to the insurrection. He told me that. When did you see him last? I haven't seen him at all for two months. We used to meet in the garden of the old house, and I... I was afraid to tell you. He may not be at the barricade. I got this letter. It came this morning. Let me see, little one. You, Mademoiselle Cosette Fauchelevent, Monsieur Fauchelevent's Rue Lame, number seven... Our marriage was impossible. I have asked my grandfather. He has refused. I am without fortune, and you also. You know the promise that I gave you. I keep it. I die. I love you. When you read this, my soul will be near you. Marius. They say that the soldiers from the government have brought cannon and aimed them at the barricade. That will end it. All day I've sat here, listening... When I hear the first cannon, I'll know surely that he's dead. You there on the barricade! Do you wish to speak to us? Surrender quietly and perish your prisoner. And we'll give you fair trial. It is you who are on trial. Give up your prisoner, the police inspector. What are your terms? Our prisoner is not a hostage. He is a spy. A policeman who masqueraded as one of us. He will be executed before the last of us. We have no terms. Down the discharge! Uh, take 
Come on here. I'll hold the north barricade. You, comrade. Yes, Marius. Go behind the tavern wall. Our prisoner, the police spy, is tied back there to a table. Shoot him. Yes, Marius. Goodbye. Goodbye, Marius. Goodbye, Marius. That's a brave man, comrade. Yes, that's a brave man. He has no fear of death. It's almost as though he were in love with her. There's one whom Marius loves more than death. He must be safe for her. Indeed? Who are you? I am her father. Father of Cosette? What, what are you doing here? How did you get into the barricade? No matter. I've come to save your comrade. He must not know that I'm here. Sound the discharge! Monsieur. Yes? Will you hold this position for me? I have orders from Marius. I must go execute the spy. Who is the spy? A police inspector who impersonated a revolutionary and was caught here on the barricade. I am to shoot him. A police inspector? Yes, monsieur. His name is Javert. Let me shoot him. What, monsieur? Let me shoot him. You hold the post. Very well, if you wish it. I wish it. Where is he? Where is Javert? Around the corner of the street, monsieur. Tied up behind the wall. Down this car! Jean Valjean. Javert. I might have expected this. To find you here amongst vandals and insurrectionists. Amongst cutthroats and destroyers of public property. God, this is as it should be. Well, well, hurry up, hurry up. I'm tied. You've got a gun. Justice is chained and the convict is free. Go on, Jean Valjean. You've got a gun. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? Jean Valjean, why did you fire that gun in the air? Have you got a knife? I knew it. Assassin! Where is your knife? In the side pocket of my coat. Assassin! Knifer! I knew you'd use a knife. You're cutting my ropes. Why are you doing this? Well, I'm unarmed. Take your revenge. You may go. What do you mean? The back streets are open. You're known to the army. They'll recognize you and you'll be safe. There's none here but us. You fool. Let me go and I'll get you. You know that. Alive or dead, I'll get you. I don't expect to leave this place. But if I should, you could find me under the name of Fauchelevent in the Rue de l'Armée, number seven. Fauchelevent. Rue de l'Armée. Why don't you kill me? Number seven. Number seven. I'll come for you. I'll be waiting. It is the story of the barricades that it fell at this moment. Everywhere was the terrible confusion of death and defeat. Jean Valjean found Marius unconscious, horribly wounded, covered with blood but still breathing. He threw the boy on his shoulder and ran to the far end of the street. But for the silent dead of the insurrection, this place was deserted. Here was peace, but no safety. Here was silence and no exit. Here were no walls to climb, no passageways, no alleys. Here was a momentary island in the midst of the armies of France. Twelve years before, Jean Valjean had been hunted down and trapped in a closed street. The child Cosette was in his arms. Now he carried her lover. He had looked up that night and seen the rope of a street lamp and found safety. Now he looked down and found there at his feet an iron door in the pavements. With Javert's own knife, he pried open the grating. In another instant, he lowered Marius and himself through this opening and was under the streets. Jean Valjean was in the sewers. Paris has another Paris under herself. A Paris of sewers which has its streets, its squares, its blind alleys, and its circulation, which is slime. The sewer is the conscience of the city. In this lurid place there is darkness, but there are no secrets. Underneath these vaults we breathe the enormous fetidness of social catastrophe. We see reddish reflections on the corners. There flows a terrible water in which bloody hands have been washed. It was in the sewer of Paris that Jean Valjean found himself. In a moment, he had passed from broad day to obscurity, from noon into midnight. 
His first sensation was blindness. He reached out his hand and touched the wall, and realized that the passage was narrow. He slipped in the water. A whip of fetidus informed him where he was. The frenzied storm of murder which was raging a few feet above him reached him as a stifled and indistinct rumbling. Then suddenly Jean Valjean had reached an angle of the sewer. And he saw before him at the extremity of the passage a light. It was a good and white light. It was day. He saw the outlet. He felt exhaustion no more. He felt Marius' weight no longer. He ran rather than walked. He reached the outlet. There he stopped. The arch was closed by a grating. A grating held in a stone frame by a stout lock. The grating did not stir. Its lock held fast. And suddenly Jean Valjean knew that a man was there, standing beside him, waist deep in the water. A man standing in the darkness. I've been waiting for you. It was Javert. You got here sooner than I expected. Inspector Javert? Yes, Jean Valjean. Grant me one favor. This boy is dying. Before you take me to prison, help me to carry him to his home. There's a carriage waiting on the beach. You are silent, Javert. I should think you would be happy. I must thank you for helping me to take that wounded boy to his family. They will be grateful to you. Javert. Yes? I'm going to ask you something more. Something I know you won't permit. Cosette. I've been with her all these years. She's... She's very dear to me. May I say goodbye to her? Driver. The Rue de l'Armée. Number seven. Well, here's your home. Go up and see her. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for you. I'll be here, below in the street. Then, then you trust me? I'll wait in the street. Jean Valjean ran up the stairway to Cosette's little room. He stopped at the landing and looked back through the window. He was bewildered by what he did not see. There was nobody in the street. Javert was gone. What was the story of Javert? Javert made his way with slow steps from the Rue de l'Arme. He plunged into the silent streets. Still, he followed one direction. He took the shortest route toward the Seine. There had been a new thing, a revolution, a catastrophe in the depths of his being. One thing had astonished him, that Jean Valjean had spared him, and one thing had petrified him, that he, Javert, had spared Jean Valjean. Where was he? He sought himself and found himself no longer. Destiny has certain extremities precipitous upon the impossible and beyond which life is no more than an abyss. Javert was at one of these extremities. Jean Valjean confounded him. All the axioms which had been the support of his whole life crumbled away before this man. A beneficent malefactor. A compassionate convict. Kind, 
helpful, clement, returning good for evil, returning pardon for hatred, loving pity rather than vengeance, preferring to destroy himself rather than to destroy his enemy, saving him who had stricken him, kneeling upon the height of virtue, nearer the angels than men, Javert was compelled to acknowledge that this monster existed. An entire new world appeared to his soul. He perceived in the darkness the fearful rising of an unknown moral sun. Truth, which he had no wish for, besieged him. He saw what he had revolted at seeing. He felt that he was emptied, useless, broken off from his past life, destitute. Authority was dead in him. He had no further reason for existence. There was only two ways to get out of it. One, to go resolutely to Jean Valjean and return the man of the galleys to the dungeon. The other... Javert made his way with a firm step toward the post indicated by a lamp at one of the corners of the Place du Chatelet. On reaching it, he entered. There was a policeman there. Javert gave his name, showed his card to the sergeant, and sat down at the table of the post on which a candle was burning. There was a pen on the table, a leaden inkstand, and some paper in readiness for chance reports and the orders of the night patrol. Javert took the pen and a sheet of paper and began to write. This is what he wrote. From the notebook of Inspector Javert, some observations for the benefit of the service. First, I beg monsieur to prefer to glance at this. Second, the prisoners on their return from examination take off their shoes and remain barefooted upon the pavement while they are searched. Many cough on returning to the prison. This involves hospital expenses. Third, it is difficult to explain why the special regulation of the prison forbids a prisoner to have a chair, even on paying for it. Fourth, the prisoners called barkers who call the other prisoners to the parlor make the prisoner pay them two sous for calling his name distinctly. This is a theft. Fifth, for a dropped thread, they retain ten sous from the prisoner in the weaving shop. This is an abuse on the part of the contractor since the cloth is just as good Six, it is certain that gendarmes are every day heard relating the examinations of those brought before the magistrates. For a gendarme who should hold such things sacred to repeat what he has heard in the examining chamber is a serious disorder. Javert, inspector of the first class. June 7th, 1832, about one o'clock in the morning. Javert dried the fresh ink on this paper, folded it very carefully, like a letter, sealed it, wrote on the back a note for the administration, left it on the table, and went slowly out of the post. The glazed and grated door closed behind him. He crossed the Place de Châtelet and gained the key... Here was darkness, darkness complete. It was that sepulchral and terrible moment which follows midnight. Javert was standing exactly over the rapids of the Seine, perpendicularly over that formidable whirlpool which knots and unknots itself like an endless screw. Javert bent his head and looked. All was black. What was beneath was not water, it was chasm. The wall of the quay abrupt, confused, 
mingled with vapor, suddenly lost to sight, seemed to him like an escarpment of the infinite. Javert, inspector of police, 30 years in the service of France, stood there on that promontory of the darkness and looked into the end of the night. He saw nothing. But he perceived the hostile chill of the water and the insipid odor of the moist stones. A fierce breath rose up from that abyss. The swollen river guessed at rather than perceived the tragical whispering of the flood, the dismal vastness of the arches of the bridge, the imaginable fall into that gloomy void. All that shadow was full of horror. Javert remained for some minutes motionless on that pinnacle in the middle of the midnight, gazing into that opening of darkness. Then suddenly, without a sound, no expression on that great, bearded, beastly face. He took off his hat and laid it on the edge of the key. A moment afterwards, a tall black form appeared standing on the parapet, bent toward the Seine, then sprang up and fell straight into the darkness. It is the last that was ever seen of Inspector Javert. W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have brought you part six of Victor Hugo's absorbing masterpiece, Les Miserables the episode which was called The Barricade. Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director, played the role of Jean Valjean and was also heard reading the narrative passages. Assisting Mr. Welles were Martin Gable as Javert, William Johnstone as Marius, Virginia Welles as Cosette, Ray Collins, Hiram Sherman, and others. Next Friday evening at 9.30 o'clock, Eastern Daylight Saving Time, we shall present the seventh and final episode of Les Miserables. This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System. Seven, the final episode of Les Miserables. In Paris on the 16th of February, 1833, there was celebrated the marriage of Cosette Fauchelevent to Marius Pomercy. The date of the wedding was Mardi Gras, and the ceremonies were held in a city gay with flowers and merrymaking. The bride's father, Monsieur Fauchelevent, having suffered a severe accident to his arm, was not present. Father, how good to see you. We missed you yesterday, but you've really come too early. Cosette is still asleep. But I can tell you the news. You are to come and live with us. It has all been decided. You are part of our happiness, Father. Cosette and I insist you share it with us. Monsieur. Is anything wrong? Is your arm still troubling you? There is nothing wrong with my arm. Is it wise for you to take the bandage off so soon? There has never been anything wrong with it. You can see for yourself. But yesterday you... You didn't come to our wedding. It was because you hurt your hand. It was the best that I should be absent from your marriage. Your pardon, Father. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Marius, I'm a convict. I've been in the galleys. The galleys? You? Cosette's father? Before God, I am not the father of Cosette. I am a peasant of Favarol. And my name is not Fauchelevent. It is Jean Valjean. That is true, monsieur. 
I believe you. Cosette is very dear to me, but... Well, ten years, I... I didn't know Cosette existed ten years ago. I am, after all, a passerby in her life. And today, our roads separate. She is now Madame Pomercy. I can do nothing for her. I leave her to your care, monsieur. But you could have kept your secret. No one would have known. Perhaps not, monsieur. But I shall always know. You think I might have been happy with you. I... Have I the right to be happy? Suppose I remain, Monsieur Fauchelevent. I come to stay with you. I. We are together. And some fine day, while we're laughing and chatting, you hear a voice shout, Jean Valjean, and the police spring out of the shadow and tear off my mask. What then? Father. Father, dearest. I've missed you so. Uh, Cosette, uh, we, uh... We're talking of business. Father, you're pale. Does your arm hurt you? It is well. What is it, then? Are you sad? No. Then kiss me. That's better. Now I shall stay. Uh, Cosette, darling, uh, we have something to finish. You still want me to go? Very well, I shall. But don't be long, please. <coughs> Poor Cosette. You must not tell her about me. I entreat you, monsieur. Cosette doesn't know what this world is. The world of the convict and the galleys. Promise me that she shall never know. I will keep your secret. Thank you, monsieur. Uh, it is all nearly finished. There is one thing left. What? You think, monsieur, you think I should not see Cosette again? I think it would be for the best. Yes. Yes. Very well, monsieur. I shall not see her again. Jean Valjean was a convict. But the bridegroom, Marius, did not know the story of his crimes. There are many crimes, and hunger was one of these in the year of our Lord, 1796. Jean Valjean, before you are sentenced, have you nothing to say to this court? I was hungry, that's all, Excellency. My sister, she and her little ones, we live at Favarol, Excellency. I, I'm, a, I'm a pruner. In the season, I earn 18 sous a day, and, and that's all. It's very hard, Excellency, and they're all hungry, Excellency. Much more hungry than me. Prisoner, this court finds, proven finally against you, the crime for which you are on trial, namely the burglary of a loaf of bread. Excellency, what does that mean? It means you're a thief. Guilty. Five years in the galleys. The galleys. Five years at the oar of a prison ship. Five years for his first offense. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Attempted escape. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended. Three years. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Escape in the second attempt. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended. Three years. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Escape in the third attempt. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended. Three years. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Escape in the first, second, and third attempts. Guilty. Escape in the fourth attempt and resistance. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended in the double chain. Five years. Jean Valjean, your term has expired. Here is your passport. Give it to me. I can read. I, I've, I've learned to read. Let me look at it. The bearer is a liberated convict, having been 19 years in the galleys for stealing a loaf of bread. Original sentence, five years. Additional servitude, 14 years. The holder of this passport is a very dangerous man. Excellency, what does that mean? It means you're free. <laughs> What had been the life of this soul? In weariness, in agony, under the whip, under the chain, in the cell, on the convict's bed of plank, under the burning sun of the galleys, Jean Valjean turned to his conscience and reflected. Human society had done him nothing but injury. He had no weapon but his hate. He had resolved to sharpen it in the galleys, 
and he had taken it with him when he went out. So the passport was right. The yellow passport, which described Jean Valjean as a very dangerous man. It was right that October night in 1815... Come in, monsieur. Shut the door. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm a convict. You hear that? Four days ago, they, they let me out. I've, I've walked all the way from Toulon. I've been 19 years in the galleries. Look, I have money. I'll, I'll pay you. Sit down, monsieur. Make yourself comfortable. Wait, wait. Did you hear what I said? I, I said I was a convict. What is this place? It's not an inn. Is this your house? No. No, this is not my house. It is the house of Christ. What are you? A priest? Aren't you afraid of me? No, monsieur. Aren't you afraid of me? Eighteen fifteen. Another crime of Jean Valjean's, of which Marius knew nothing. A crime committed that October night, eighteen years before, in the house of the Bishop of Dives. It was the bishop himself who opened the door that night to the convict, Jean Valjean. He made a place for him at his table and gave him a bed in his best chamber, the first bed Jean Valjean had slept in for 19 years. And Jean Valjean lay in his bed, sleepless, all through that long October night. He had many thoughts. He thought first of the goodness of the Bishop of D, and then thought of his silver. The Bishop's silver. Six silver plates. He had seen them at dinner. Two hundred francs worth of silver. Double his pay for 19 years' labor in the chains. It is true that he stole them. It is true that Jean Valjean stole the plates from the Bishop of D. It is true that he sold these plates for 200 francs and that he used this money to make himself rich. Under the name of Madeleine in the district of Montreux, he set up a workshop for the manufacture of synthetic jet. He prospered. He built a great factory. He became mayor of the city. It is true that Jean Valjean did this with the six silver plates he stole that night from the Bishop of D. It is true also that Jean Valjean was never convicted of this crime. Yes, monsieur. We are the police, monseigneur. Please, officer. Silence, prisoner. Monseigneur, this man has been apprehended on the highway in the criminal possession of your plate. Good morning, Valjean. You recognize him, monseigneur. That is enough. Here is your silver. Yes, but where are my candlesticks? Here are the stolen plates, monseigneur. Were there candlesticks also? Oh, yes. They are of silver like the rest. Valjean, where are my candlesticks? I didn't take them. Monsieur Valjean, I don't think you understood. I gave you the candlesticks as well. What? What do you mean? Monseigneur, the, the prisoner was running off with your plate. And he told you that they were given him by an old priest with whom he had lodged the night. And you brought him here. Yes, Monseigneur. Then... Oh, then it's true what he told me? I have given him the silver. Then we can let him go? Of course. But, but it, they aren't mine. Monsieur, the plates and the candlesticks are yours. Take them. But never forget you have promised me to use this silver to become an honest man. I, I have promised you? Jean Valjean, I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity. And I give it to Almighty God. Jean Valjean ran out of the city and made haste into the open country. A little gypsy boy passed by him and dropped a penny. Jean Valjean put his foot on the penny and ran after the boy. But he never found him. Another crime. He knew then that he must either conquer or be conquered. It was after this that Jean Valjean, the poor farmer who became a galley slave, established himself in Montreux as Monsieur Madeleine, the owner of a great factory and a public official. So Jean Valjean was sentenced forever 
to a new life. And a miracle was worked in his soul by the Bishop of D. Marius knew the father of his bride, Monsieur Fauchelevent, and it came to be that he found out the convict, Jean Valjean. But Marius never heard of the wealthy manufacturer, Monsieur Madeleine, the inventor of a process for the manufacture of imitation jet, the public benefactor, the mayor of Montreux, who, like Fauchelevent, was Jean Valjean. In 1823, this Madeleine was a quiet, hopeful man with but two thoughts in his heart, to conceal his name and to sanctify his life, to escape from men and to return to God. But even in 1823, Jean Valjean was wanted by the police, and there came a dark day in that year when they thought they had him. Certainly a man who looked like Jean Valjean was arrested and accused of Jean Valjean's crime, the theft of a penny. And certainly Jean Valjean, known as Madeleine, attended this man's trial. Monsieur Madeleine... Your honor, the judge. Your note was sent in to me, monsieur. Permit me to say that your presence in this court is an unexpected compliment. Thanks, sir. Will you sit here, monsieur Madeleine? We will resume the trial. Your Excellency, the judge. Your honor, monsieur Madeleine, gentlemen of the jury. Who is this man? He is Jean Valjean, accused of one crime for which he is on trial, but he is wanted for another. Highway robbery committed for the gain of one penny from a small boy encountered on the fields outside of D. Convict this Jean Valjean, and he shall be tried again. What does the man say for himself? May I question him? Why, if it will interest you, Monsieur Madeleine. Thank you. Monsieur Valjean, how long have you been a pruner? His honor is speaking to you, prisoner. Reply to him. I don't know, monsieur. My name isn't Valjean. Look here, I, I'm, I'm telling the truth. You've only to ask if it isn't so. Ask how stupid I am. <laughs> ask him. I, I don't know what you want of me. <laughs> Officer, in fourth order, I am about to pronounce sentence on this man. One moment. Your Excellency. Your Excellency, may I be permitted a few words on behalf of the accused? I'd like to tell you about Jean Valjean. Why, certainly, Monsieur Madeleine. Excellency, they were right when they told you that Jean Valjean was an outlaw. It's true he was a galley slave. It's true he was a criminal. The pennies were stolen, and the loaf of bread, and the bishop was robbed. But mark you, gentlemen, the galleys make the galley slave. This man was a poor peasant, an idiot. He was changed in the galleys. He was stupid. He was made wicked. He was saved later by indulgence and kindness. As he was lost by severity. You won't understand this. There are some things which... which cannot be told. I cannot relate to you the story of Jean Valjean's life. Someday you will know it. He has done what he could. He has disguised himself under another name. He has desired to enter again amongst honest men. It seems this cannot be. Gentlemen, your prisoner is not he who is on trial before you. Release this man. He is innocent. Gentlemen, I am Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean... You are charged with concealing your identity and changing your name. How do you plead? Guilty. Jean Valjean, you are sentenced to hard labor in the galleys under the double chain for the rest of your life. But Jean Valjean escaped from the galleys that same year and was never retaken. He was hunted. For 11 years, he lived in the shadows, cowering. Sometimes no more than a step from the terrible creature who pursued him. The policeman, Javert. But now Javert was no more... Small comfort now. Cosette was no more. She belonged to another. She whose childhood was passed in his sight like a summer's day. Whose cares were his only care. Whose joys were his only joy. Who shared with him his only happiness in a long lifetime of misery. Who owned his heart and a whole lifetime of love. Her he had given up. Totally. He was wealthy. He relinquished wealth. He was free, he relinquished freedom. We have seen Jean Valjean give up the world to save a man from the galleys. The cost was not so great to him 
as this. I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity, and I give it to Almighty God. We have seen many things happen to Jean Valjean of which Marius and even Cosette never learned. We have seen crimes which Marius judged without knowing, and more than that, we have beheld the resurrection and transfiguration of a human soul. We know the story without retelling it of Cosette's mother. We have seen Jean Valjean as Fauchelevent, the father of Cosette, and we have seen him at the barricades, saving Marius from the insurrection so that Marius could take Cosette from him. We have seen him dragging Marius through the hideous muck of the Paris sewers and into safety. It is only important to remember here that Marius was unconscious, that Marius knew nothing of the manner of his rescue and never dreamt that Jean Valjean or Monsieur Fauchelevent was his savior. During the months which followed, Jean Valjean came no longer to the house where Marius Pontmercy lived with his wife Cosette in the Rue de Cabler. But shopkeepers in the neighborhood noticed that every day an old man dressed in black came towards that street. When there were but a few houses left between him and this street, this street which appeared to attract him, his pace became so slow but at times it appeared as if he ceased to move. And when he reached the street, he stopped, trembled, put his head with a kind of gloomy timidity beyond the corner of the last house and looked into the street. There was in that tragic look something which resembled the bewilderment of the impossible and the reflection of a forbidden paradise. He remained thus a few minutes as if he had been stoned. Later, the old man ceased to go as far as this corner, and then one day, he did not appear. Jean Valjean was very ill. Come in. Father. Cosette. Cosette. <laughs> Is it you, Cosette? Father, where have you been? Why have you left us so long? Oh, so you're here, Monsieur Marius. Do you forgive me? Forgive you? He asked me to forgive him after what he has done for me. Monsieur, I have done nothing for you. Nothing? You saved my life. You must be mistaken, Monsieur. I was mistaken, but not now. Perhaps you've forgotten a certain coachman. A coachman who drove you through the streets of Paris during the fighting. He has told me everything. Marius, what do you mean? But for your father, I wouldn't be alive today. My darling, he was the man. That barricade, the sewer, he went through it for me, for you, Cosette. He bore me through death in every form. Why have you not told it before? I... I told the truth. No, not the whole truth. I owe my life to you. Father, your hands are colder. Are you suffering? No, no. I am not suffering. I'm... On the contrary, my little one. I'm very well, only... Only what, Father? I shall die in a few minutes. Father! It is nothing to die. It is frightful not to live. Father, here. We will help you. Cosette, he must lie down. Now, Father. children. Children, I want you to listen to me. This money belongs to you. I've written you a letter about it. 600,000 francs. Every penny earned honestly from the jet factory at Montreux. I shall have lost my life if you do not enjoy it. You see, the black jet comes from England. And the white jet comes from Norway. You, you understand then how much money can be made. And, and then the class must be bent, not soldered. It's all written out. There. Now come closer. Come closer, both of you. Father. You'll weep for me a little. Not too much. You must amuse yourselves a great deal, my children. Twelve dozen cost only ten francs and sell for sixteen. 
And that's really a good business. And you can be rich without concern. You find my letter, Cosette. I've written it all down to you. And, Cosette, I bequeath the two candlesticks. There, on the mantel. They are silver, but to me they are gold. They are diamond. They were given me by the... by the good Bishop of D. I wonder... will he be satisfied with me... in heaven? I've done what I could. Father, do you want a priest? No. No. I have one. He had fallen backward. The light from those silver candlesticks, the candlesticks of the Bishop of D, fell upon him. His white face looked up toward heaven. He let Cosette and Marius cover his hands with kisses. For Jean Valjean was dead. That night was starless and very dark. It is certain that in that gloom, some mighty angel was standing with outstretched wings, awaiting this soul. Jean Valjean, I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity, and I give it to Almighty God. W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have brought you the seventh and final episode of Les Miserables. Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director, played the role of Jean Valjean and was also heard reading the narrative passages. Assisting Mr. Welles were Frank Reddick as the bishop, William Johnstone as Marius, Virginia Wells as Cosette, and Ray Collins and Hiram Sherman. W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have taken great pleasure in bringing to its listeners this unusual radio version of one of the world's great stories, the credit for which is due to everyone who participated in the production. This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System.